Hi, welcome to the second Net That Hall Compass show of the 21-22 season. Um, as we said last week, we're going to be going at 9.30 p.m. UK every Tuesday. At the moment, Hibbo, unfortunately, is locked up still. So hopefully he'll be back from his Rapunzel Tower once we reach over 1K subs on Friday. In the meantime, I'm joined by co-host, fellow fantasy football hub writer, uh, Gabriel. So at FPL Lens. And everybody wish Hibbo luck in his interview. How are you, Gabe? Hey, Nima. I'm doing well, man. Thank you. It's good to be here. Super excited to announce this evening's guest. And uh, we're joined by a friend of the show, Hall of Fame number 45, also obviously a fellow fantasy football hub writer, Abdul Rahman at FPL underscore Salah. Abdul, welcome to Net That Hall. Hi. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. Excited. Excited to be on. Amazing. So let's just get a little bit of housekeeping out of the way and then we'll get right to the interview with you, Abdul. So lots of new viewers on tonight. We got to the 20 likes before we came on. Um, I was holding Abdul hostage. He wasn't allowed to come on air or get back to his evening and life back at home. But thank you for the likes, guys. So when the channel hits 1000 subs, we've uh, pledged that we're going to donate $100 to charity and we're going to do it again at 2K subs. So, you know, hit like, hit subscribe. It costs you nothing. We're going to have to put our hand in our pockets and it is for a good cause. Okay, if, uh, if you want to join our mini league, right, the code is FG1XNB. Uh, come join us, take on the crew, plus our special guests will also be there. Tom, C Tom, Tom Stevenson is in the league, of course. Big Man Buckar is in the league. FPL Matthew in the league. So are we, uh, for whatever that's worth. <laughs> so uh, get, get in there, take on the best in the business and us as well um and the, the prize actually this year is a, a a year's subscription to fantasy football fix and a copy of fpl obsessed by matt whelan who goes by at fpl obsessed on twitter super nice guy really really interesting book so um yeah get in that league fg1 xmb nice so i just like to say a quick shout out normally to anyone who's live viewing while we're here so thank you guys i know it's quite early for some of you like 3 30 in the morning in india so I just want to say thank you, Andy Martin. So he's going to be able to watch the whole show tonight. So shout out to you. Thanks for coming back. We've got uh, another returning member of the crew. So we've got Ramanathan. Uh, thank you, FPL4P. Um, Amun's already here, but he's still waiting to see if Hibbo's bought a plant. Uh, I know that Gabe will tell you about the drawing in the background that he's got after hearing Amun's threats online. He, he was nervous he'd get uh, <laughs> trolled next. So... We've got a Sean Jackson who's got a job interview tomorrow and isn't on the show, but you know that's actually Hibbo for those that don't know. And we will release him, as I said, at 1K subs with the donation. So please help him too. Um, hello, Pato. Nice to see you. Thanks. Yep. Hope you're well too. And then just a few more people who've been waiting in the chat patiently. So we've got Donnie here, friend of the show. We've got General Zod returning. We've got Jamie Baker, so Baker, FPL Baker. And then we've got Adam Tessiman. So welcome evening. Blue Danube guys back. Nice to see you, mate. Uh, Gary Swan, greetings. And there's a little wave from Andy again. We're ready to go. Okay, guys. I'm sorry for the podcast listeners. I hope the ones listening on audio do skip past this stage each week. Um, I don't expect you to go through it, but live, I think it's an interactive element and we love to kind of talk to you all and make it an evening with the whole crew. So just a final thing. So we're actually going to have a TikTok uh, net that hall launching soon with FPR underscore Baker's support. So thank you for that. And Bungle the Guna as well on Twitter. He's joined as a moderator, as I mentioned last time. So, you know, if there's any other haulers out there who want to get involved with the crew, you know, do drop us a message with your ideas and let's see how we can grow this community together. Okay, now that housekeeping is kind of out of the way, let's get to the meat of the episode why everyone's here. Um, you know, Abdul, as we said, he's Hall of Famer, number 45. He's got four top 1Ks, which is in itself insane. I've always wanted a triple digit finish, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, five top 5Ks, again, something that's insane. And for me, the most impressive part is actually the last three seasons. So he's at an average of about 8.4K OR. And these are the seasons with the most FPL managers that have ever played this game. So he's got a you know 4.9K, 19.6K, and a 700 rank in that time. So Abdul, my first question kind of for you is, how did you you know get into playing FPL? What happened when you joined in 2007, 2008? Mm -hmm. how, how did that kind of come about? Yeah. So the first season, I actually joined in Game Week 2 because obviously I didn't have a clue about fantasy football or what it was until one of my mates introduced me to it. So he... He, he was telling me about it and he asked me to enter the league. So 
just entered there without knowing what kind of what I was getting myself into. Um, and then I ended up winning that league. Like it was like a mini league between friends. Like even though I started in game week two and had like, uh, you know, they all had a head start. So just from there, I just kind of got hooked because I just thought, you know, I just thought I was amazing at it because, you know, I beat these guys, um, you know, with, with uh, one game week head start. And uh, at that time, I didn't have a clue about overall rank or, you know, any of these fans for websites. But ever since then, I just, I just been hooked. And then my second season is when I kind of started kind of, uh, you know, going on to the, the websites and all that kind of stuff and really, really getting addicted to it. So, yeah, that's how it started off. Very nice. I guess something that we should ask straight up. I know you have answered it on other shows, but for anyone who might be new to you, um, I do like to ask, but I have my own twist on it. So I hope you forgive me in advance. Um, my initial kind of question was, how did the name FPL Salah come about? I'm really interested in the history of it, because obviously, as we know, you're a Man United fan. So just tell me a little bit about that. And I have a counter argument to your Oh, right. answer. Yeah, yeah, I've worked yeah, on yeah. it. I don't want you to say the same thing you said on other shows. So I'm going to ask you something new today at the end of why you tell us why you're called FPL Sam. Okay. okay. So yeah. So yeah. But yeah. I mean, I think some people would have already kind of known as well from from other shows if they watched it. But yeah. So I'm a Man United fan, but my my username is FPL Salah just simply because. I mean, firstly, like I, I really like him as a player. Uh, I'm not one of those kind of tribal kind of football fans who, you know, just doesn't like other players because they play for a. For the opposition or you know, like a rival team, but the, the main reason is because um, because I mean when he first came to league and he was like banging the goals and he, you know he was kind of a world superstar. It's like the way he was kind of like you know uh, not ashamed of his religion. He was he was you know bowing down to God after he was scoring goals, and I feel that brought a really positive light uh, onto Islam, and which is obviously my religion. I'm a Muslim and he's a Muslim, so I really like that fact, and I really like the fact that I think. By by him by him just just doing that was just kind of you know changing people's opinions of of religion because I mean since nine eleven I mean you know Islam's had a really bad really bad reputation you know like especially in the media the way it's portrayed and you know some people might might have you know a certain perception of it and in a way you probably can't blame them because that's the only kind of source of information they get regarding get regarding Islam but uh, you know then but when you see like you know Mo Salah you know millionaire footballer, you know, banging the goals and then, you know, the first thing he does is, is you know, bow down to his God and pray to his God. And that really kind of makes people think. So, yeah, kind of in a nutshell, that, that was the main reason why why I loved the guy, um, just because he kind of, you know, was was really kind of, you know, like, you know, preaching the beauty of our religion without even, like, talking about it. It was just kind of through his actions. So, yeah. I really like that. So he just kind of represented everything that was good in Islam, which the media wasn't focusing on. And as you say, since 9-11 times have been quite um, stressful with the kind of Islamophobia in the media as well, exactly. right? Exactly. There's, exactly. I, there, there's a lot of nice messages in, in that simple act, right? One is like kind of just stop talking. And, and because in talking, people bicker and they, have their, they take their sides and stuff. But this is just an act of appreciation. No words are necessary. And he brings joy to what sometimes is a too serious conversation around religion. It's just about yeah, exactly. Love. exactly. You know, I think it's good for the kind of the youth as well because when I was growing up, there wasn't really like you know a, a big Muslim superstar who who I could kind of relate to and who, who kind of give me that confidence. But I think with uh, nowadays, there's a lot more. I mean, you've got obviously Mo Salah, obviously like you know kind of out with football. You've got Khabib Nurmagomedov, who's you know like, like UFC fighter. Uh, so there's a lot of kind of big with some superstars now who who give like you know um, a bit of confidence to you know younger Muslims who are maybe in school and you know they're not feeling as confident about their religion or their identity. Like that's, I'm talking about coming out my own experiences. Like that's how I felt when I was at school. Uh, you know, I was kind of like a bit um, embarrassed about kind of telling people about my religion because it was different. And I believe like, you know guys like this kind of bring that confidence out in the youth, and you know they're, they're not ashamed because like. They're a Muslim, and then okay, Mo Salah is a Muslim, and so is so is Khabib. So you know, that's, th those guys are pretty cool. So you know, that's what. That, that's a that's a great story. I love it. Yeah. I think just to say we're on like nearly 30 likes already and we've not even begun on the FPL content and we're 10 <laughs> minutes in. So this is definitely, again, I think people like Tom Stevenson, they like Abdul, they like players like you who are kind of very humble, I would say, Abdul, and have a top record and history. And 
the fact that your only top kind of 200k finish came when you played in game week two and you still won your mini leagues i can see why you got addicted yeah. um, but before we yeah. do go on to fpl there is one more thing i did say i was going to ask for a, a, a kind of forgiveness later rather than permission up front but so i i've obviously light-hearted joke but i agree with everything you said about salah why not yeah. fpl pogba um because the main reason was because he like that season where i kind of made my twitter account was was the season where it was uh, Mo Salah's first season he was like banging the goals and he was uh, i had him in my team so it was like you know he was doing really well for me fans football wise as well and um I just, I just don't feel like that kind of Pogba had that same um that kind of same pool that I had in terms of I mean he, he is a player Pogba is a proud Muslim as well but he wasn't doing the things that Salah was doing like you know he wasn't showing the grace yeah he wasn't he said. Doing, uh, as as outwardly hmm. uh, I, th- I think I mean I, th- I think it's more known now but I think back then I, I mean if you ask people I don't think they would have known that, uh, that Pogba was a Muslim um, you know, I think it's only kind of yeah, I think a lot of people can't tell, yeah. So he's like one of the players that falls into that category where you find out they've been kind of praying pre match, and you're like, Oh, I didn't yeah. realize they were Muslim, that's interesting. Yeah. Whereas with yeah. Sattler, like it's obvious, yeah. like he's an inspiration to them all over the world. Okay, I like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna let um Gabe tell us a little bit about his history because I feel like. <laughs> Like he's obviously here with us. He's a fantastic footballing brain. He's a real coach for anyone who's not joined us before. He's um, actually certified as well, and he knows his strategy. And he's famous for his kind of articles where he uses video stills and shows you actual kind of like drawings on those about what was going on and the tactics that the coaches employ. So I think it's fascinating stuff. But from an FPL perspective, I think he might be quite different to you, Abdul. <laughs> but let's hear his yeah. story because um, I think his worst, so your worst ever finish might kind of be a beacon of hope for some of yours Gabe right <laughs> I mean most things are a beacon of hope for some of mine <laughs> some of my finishes, to be fair I think I think I, I probably had maybe the opposite record well first it's not as long I didn't want to say opposite by the way I let you say that I yeah I appreciate you uh, at least giving me <laughs> something to say there <laughs> um, but I mean uh, opposite so I I started playing in 2015 2016 but you know I was Total casual, bit of a ghost ship sometimes. I, I, I think I maybe played through probably until Christmas, and then I probably left the left the uh, the you know I just gave up on it. Um, a big change for me came so it was like a, a couple of seasons later. It was ten week game weeks to play in the 2017 2018 season. Um, that's when I that's when I became aware of the existence of overall rank. I had no idea that there was any ranking in this game or, or anything outside of a, outside of a mini league, and that that kind of blew my mind a little bit. So I, I was wondering for you, you know, what have been some kind of seismic epiphanies in this game that you've um, for you and your time playing in FPL, and 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 then what kind of player would you consider yourself? Aggressive, passive, patient, impatient. Yeah, I mean, I'd say I'm I'm, I'm definitely like a really patient. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of people would call me a, a boring manager because uh, I'm. I mean, I'm, I'm quite. I'm, I'm quite simple and I'm, I'm a template player, especially at the start of the season. Um, I don't take many risks on captains. I usually captain like you know the, the obvious kind of premium players who've got the best fixture. I don't take kind of you know like um, big punts on on the captains very often at all. Um, so yeah, I'd say I was quite. I would say I was, I was patient. I think. I think. Being, I think patience is probably, I'd say, one of my strengths. Hmm. Um, I, I do. I mean, it wasn't like that when I first started playing, but over the years, I have kind of developed a, a skill, I'd say, and kind of, you know, um, you know, especially when you've had a bad game, you just kind of taking a step back and thinking with a cool head. And that's helped me a lot over the years. And, and what about just the, any kind of big lessons where, where it's really changed either the, the way you play or, or, or the way you see the game? Yeah, I mean, I'd say, I'd say the kind of, uh, I mean, not any like kind of huge seismic moments, but I'd say that the introduction of like things like expected goals, you know, uh, expected assists, and like you know, modelling, like you know, you get, you've got your modellers like you know, Mikel Topvam and FPLreview.com. Um, I think that side of the game um, has really kind of, uh, I'd say in a way that kind of revolutionised the way the way I actually play the game because I'm I'm a lot more stats stats based now. Uh, and I focus on on these things a lot more. I think that's really helped me. 
I mean, if you see, like, I, I would say probably around about after like, it was mid 2017 18 season where I finished 12k, it was where I kind of really started to go down the kind of stats route. Uh, you know, that's kind of when um, FPL started. I mean, uh, FPL has been growing for the past decade, but it's in the last few years it's it's really grown and it's. Mm. I mean, you've got like FPL computers as well, where people are kind of introducing computers and you know uh, making algorithms and things like that. So I, I would say the introduction of you know like a more advanced kind of uh, stat system has, has really kind of helped my game mm. and you know really changed the way I play. I think um, for me as well, like I would say that as an FPL kind of coach, like you're definitely someone who I would have followed and I came much later. So I joined in 2012, 13 when I started playing and it was through work mini leagues and like Gabe, I probably didn't know that OR existed for a while at least. And then yeah. a few seasons in after having one year where I missed the game week one deadline by five minutes. So just quit. Eventually when I came back, I was a better manager. So my, my, my partner was very happy back at that time. She, she was just in the relationship with me recently didn't realize FPL was such a big part of my life back then because I missed the deadlines. I didn't play that year. And then later, in many years to go, she would be like, oh, wow, how have you come back early from the honeymoon to go to this FPL meetup? <laughs> uh, Fergie was calling me out on a podcast live earlier to like 500 people. Uh, but yeah, so that's where we are. And I guess I, I've, in all that time since I started, my point was so that when I then did come back from that little break, I ended up kind of playing much like you. So I, I kind of strived always top 100K, haven't really fallen out of that within the last five years being around that region had one amazing year the year we met and i remember yeah, that was yeah. when i felt like i i don't know what was going on but everything seemed to work all the 50 50s right <laughs> it was a crazy season. That, that was my best but i'll never yeah. get that triple digit like you i don't think i think that was my closest dance with yeah. destiny there but yeah, you've yeah, done it four yeah. times abdul so how yeah. tell, tell us so what do you have to do differently maybe in the seasons where you've say gone top 1k compared to the years where you've just missed, say, the top 5K, so you might have finished, like, you know, yeah. 7K or 8K. What's the difference? Like, do you kind of consolidate at one point towards the end, or do you find yourself pushing? So do you kind of go yeah. away from that non-risky patient approach if there's, like, seven weeks left and you have a chance of top 1K? Yeah, no, exactly. So, like, if, it really depends where I'm at. I mean, if I'm, say, like, you know, kind of say if I'm in top 1K, I'm leading many leagues in that, I might look kind of, you know, uh, consolidate my rank uh, more than you know, kind of take risks. But if I'm chasing a rank, like if I'm outside the top 10k, especially you know, if it's seven game weeks to go, then that's that's when I would start taking risks. Um, I mean, and by taking risks, I, I wouldn't say like you know, going going crazy with differentials, and I'd say more like you know, you know, just maybe picking you know, maybe the second or third favorite captain and not going for the favorite captain, you know, kind of looking for a kind of opportunities where you know, there might be like you know, a split in terms of you know. Two players with you know great fixtures, but one player will will, will have a much higher ownership and you know much higher you know captaincy, and then you kind of go for the opposite one. So yeah, um, I would I would take this in, in those sort of situations. And I think in my um, in, in the two seasons that I finished, like so that I think I've got on the screen here. So um, yeah, so 2013, 14, I finished 11k. And then you know, 2017, 18, I finished 12k. Those two seasons, I was, um, you know, I was, I was in like the top 10k, and I was kind of really close to the top 1k. So I was, I was chasing that, and it just both those seasons went horribly wrong, and uh, you know, I kind of finished outside the top 10k. So um, okay, so that's really interesting because I thought you would have said that you know when you're in the top 1k you might push to try and win the whole thing, but you actually said that's when you consolidate, and when you're behind, that's when you take more risk, and then you've kind of shown here like the two times when you didn't do that, when you went against your kind of style and strategy of play, yeah. when you were close to top 1K and you tried to push, it actually led to you kind of then maybe falling out the top 10K when you went against your normal instinct as a coach. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like when you're top 1K and, and you know, it's kind of near the end of the season, I mean, realistically, I think you're still very, I mean, massive odds for, for you to actually win it because I mean, even at that point, you're probably around about you know 150 points behind world number one. So wow. you, you, you're, you're not you're not going to. I mean, you're probably not going to win it. But maybe yeah, you can go for the top 500 or top 100. But I mean, when when you play safe, it doesn't necessarily mean like you know you're um, you're playing for a rank. It just means that you're protecting your rank, and you, and you can still kind of go up in rank uh, while you're kind of you know look while you're you know playing to consolidate. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know you can. 
you can hit your captains, you can, you know, get your you know your, your differentials that you've that you've got that I've got low ownership. You know they can they can bang and then you can you know fight the rankings. But um, yeah, so I don't. I mean, when it's when you say consolidate, it doesn't mean like you know you're trying to just stay mm-hmm. at that rank. It just means you're kind of trying not to fall further behind. And by consolidating, I mean I've, I've played that way, like you know where I've been in the top one k and I've, I've I've kind of played safe, but I've still gone up in rank. Um, so I think um, yeah, it needs to be made clear that. Um, when you're consolidating, it doesn't mean that you're just kind of you know playing defensively. That that's really interesting. I guess um, before we then continue on to FPL, I know that Lens was really keen to find out what kind of player you are, and I think you've given a really great explanation that kind of safe and consolidation doesn't necessarily mean you can't go up rank. And I think there's yeah. a lot of talk on Twitter where people take kind of risks, and people ask me tips about how to kind of avoid the noise of FPL Twitter when you're kind of also then playing the game. And my, my biggest kind of tip has always been that. Don't just kind of say you're going to captain a player, transfer them in for likes or for clout, like in yeah. case it pays off. Because most of the time it won't. Like, so, so I see what you mean. Like, there seems to be this overabundance of when it does pay off, everyone hears about it, the tweet goes viral, but no one yeah. tweets when it goes horribly wrong and they fall fifty points behind where they were and lose all their rank gain. So I think being safe doesn't mean you can't gain rank. But I appreciate that by you not doing those things, kind of by letting social media's noise get to you. And that's kind of where my next question comes in is you obviously have about 40K followers. Um, so yeah. you've got quite a big following. You write for Fantasy Football Hub, a lot of articles. Um, you've got a hugely impressive 21,000 word kind of preseason series that I think yeah. everybody yeah. should check out. So yeah. I'm definitely yeah. going to tweet that out as well for you after the show. But yeah. my main kind of point is what's the backstory there? So like, did you start writing independently or have you always just been writing for Fantasy Football Hub? Yeah, yeah um, I mean, that kind of started when my account was quite new, I think I had around about 4,000 followers at the time. And, um, you know, I was, uh, I'd, I'd done the kind of anytime scorer and clean sheet odds, you know, quite early on, like, you know, when I made my account. And uh, I just remember Will getting in touch, uh, you know, uh, Will, uh, who's the CEO of um, Fancy Will Hub, just got in touch and asked, you know, if I wanted to start maybe writing some articles about, um, you know, like, about my, my, my clean sheet and uh, anytime goal scorer odds, you know, just kind of writing articles kind of related to that and, you know, t- you know, picking the best players kind of, uh, you know, kind of um, in relation to the odds. And I just said, yeah, and I just kind of started from there. I, I just started off slowly, you know, maybe one or two a month. And I just kind of, I just kind of snowballed from there. I just kind of, you know, got the hang of it. I started enjoying it more. I got more used to, like, writing and, you know, looking at stats. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, probably, it's, it's definitely improved my game as well. Uh, you know, because when you're, when you're kind of, Writing, you're, you're doing a lot of research, um, you know, when you're writing and you're looking at all the stats and you know all the players and you know how they play. So yeah, that's that's how we started off, and yeah, it's just kind of grown from there. I think it's been on about two years now. I've been writing for them. Nice two year anniversary. I think yeah. I remember messaging you in. I think it might have been last year october november maybe it was even this april and i found it on linkedin app, but i thought you would love this um i was kind of like oh i was looking for fantasy football hub to add it to my linkedin and you cropped up and i was like oh your title is so awesome can i copy it so i've been kind of i guess my point is um what do they call it like kind of plagiarism is flattery in this scenario because <laughs> I, I wanted to be like you as both a manager in my style but also that you're writing you're kind of two years i guess i've been doing it for one year i was like kind of always aspiring to be a bit like you and bakar obviously who we both talked to quite a lot and yeah. i think it was great that you two pushed me into becoming a writer and you kind of encouraged me back then even to get going and just do it and i'm so glad i listened yeah. and yeah no, so you guys were my inspiration and definitely this twenty one thousand word series as impressive as it is, it's nothing on just the sheer content I see coming out from you. Um, I made a joke recently that you were like a kind of a robot churning out FPL content because I've seen you submitting stuff to editorial parts yeah. midnight. Like you're one of the hardest working guys I know in FPL. That's what I was. <laughs> I wanted to make sure all our viewers knew that that your content yeah, is amazing and it's so fascinating to hear how you kind of got approached and headhunted. I really like that. It shows the caliber of person we're talking mm-hmm. about. Yeah, no, thanks, thanks. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I've, I, I see. I seem to have like a lot of time because I'm, I'm a late sleeper, so um, you know, I, I can't I can't sleep before midnight, even even on work days. So yeah, I just use that time to to, to, to for fans football for writing the, for writing articles, etc. So yeah, so I think I've got that advantage with me. <laughs> yeah, unstoppable. No, I love it. Yeah. So. 
That that's really awesome. Um, I guess Gabe, did you want to maybe maybe take us back to FPL because I feel like Mariner are proud da of the show, so we call him Abdul our da as Hibbo calls him. Apparently, it means dad. Yeah. Now, see, so maybe you know what he means, but I don't. He's like our he's like our mini FPL general. So I'm a mini FPL satellite. He's a mini general. We're all here trying to mimic you guys, but we'll see. Um, so I'll let Gabe steer us back in the right direction before Mariner wakes up next morning in Singapore and sees that he's given me the reins to the stream yard and we've next not let you go you know, into you Yeah, before you know it, I won't be back on the show for a <laughs> while. Like, but, um, <laughs> I've already seen Hibbo try to uh, change the rank up I'm going to call him out live on air because it's something I do every week. I call someone out and why not be Hibbo? So he's, um, <laughs> he's the one who tried to make me update the slides to uh, hey, Hall of Fame number 45. I put 41. But he's a he's he's got OCD and he's very pedantic about checking scouts <laughs> forums and I say you know all of us here are free hub writers he's also a hub writer I, f- I feel disgusted like spit that he went and looked up the scout hall of fame to even check but I'm sorry I just wanted to clarify I didn't want you to think I wrote hall of fame 45 so I call out Hibbo today before Gabe steers us back in the right direction yeah. I was I was actually going to push us forward a little bit um, because you know we, we kind of covered it. we kind of covered the the kind of manager you are um, Abdul and, and obviously it, it's working for you so you, there's there's no problem there I was wondering um, you know when when you talked about getting into FPL you know you said a, a friend invited you um, to a mini league and it was game week two um, were you a were you a football guy before then and and I wonder like do you do you have time are you able to to watch games um how many games do you watch if possible and uh and what role the eye test plays in your fpl analysis yeah i mean yeah i've, I've always been a football guy you know since you know since uh, since i can remember um and, and the fans you play football. yeah yeah um i've, I've not played i don't play as a regular now but I, I played a lot when i was younger mm-hmm. um played in school you know uh for teams and that um but oh, since since I got married, really, uh, probably I think a similar story for m- most guys. Um, you know, I've, I've played a lot less. But yeah, I've always been a football guy, um, and uh, always loved football. I was just I was just fans. Football got me even even more into it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I tried to watch as much as many matches as I can. I mean, last season it's probably the most matches I've ever watched, like you know, live, just because obviously, uh, you know, the timings, you know, because all the matches were live and you know they were kind of spread out. Um, um, usually, like in a normal season, in the kind of non-COVID season, I'd probably watch maybe one or two, mostly like one live match um, at the weekend. Uh, you know, the, probably the, the, the kind of main kind of header. You know, the United game. match. Sorry. The United match. Yeah, probably like you know whoever's whoever's playing live on TV because in, in the UK we don't we, we only have, we can only watch what you know Sky or BT put on, so we can, we can't pick you know which match to watch. So just whatever the match is, is headlining. And, um, and, you know, you usually just catch kind of highlights of the match today. But um, what I found interesting was I think last season, as I said, it was when I watched the most live matches. I, I don't think the eye test really helps me or helped me that much in terms of, you know, my fantasy football. I just love watching football, obviously, because, you know, I love football. But um, in terms of, like, FPL-wise, I think it's, it's, always, it's always, comes down, always comes down to the stats for me. I look at the stats I and mean, mm. not really i mean I, I do think eye test helps and it's good to watch and it's good to you know you might notice little things here and there but um i think on the whole um i don't think the eye test makes much difference in my opinion mm. that's interesting and i i guess the the flip side of that is does that does fpl affect your your watching your viewing and the experience of the game oh yeah definitely i mean like so it goes the other way. It just doesn't go from the eye test to FPL, but it goes FPL back to you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like obviously, I mean, I mean, if you play FPL, then you know you're kind of interested in matches like you know Burnley Newcastle, uh, you know, whereas uh, before you know you wouldn't you wouldn't think twice about watching that game. But yeah, it's, it definitely has. An, I mean, playing FPL definitely has an effect on on your kind of real life football experience. I think. That Abdul, I guess. So then, on the stat side, because you say that that's something that you're probably more focused on but you do obviously have some attention given to eye test but you found that watching too much last season maybe ends up making us overthink which i agree with um and i still try to watch a lot of games but definitely i overthink when i watch because some players are great 
and um, they yeah. do the Hollywood passes and then you get sucked into buying them when the hard numbers yeah. show they, they aren't the right choice. So what's your yeah. approach in terms of stats, I guess? So like after each game weekend, do you like, what do you dive into? Is it different stats per player position? Um, what kind of sample size do you look at? Is it season long, last four weeks, last six weeks? Yeah, so stats wise, like, you know, kind of before the introduction of like X, XG and XA, like you know, expected roles and that, I would I would primarily look at you know shots in the box, shots on target, uh, you know big chances, big chances created. So I'm not one that goes kind of really detailed in the stats. Like you know, I see some people kind of going into kind of stats like you know kind of chances conceded down the left side, down the right side, and you know if you, if you enjoy that sort of thing, fine. But I, I don't feel um, you really need to. I think the kind of the, the, that that is the main stats that like, you know like you know for attacker, it's shots in the box, shots on target, big chances. Uh, you know, for for midfielders, it's big chances created, and obviously XG and XA kind of rolls that into kind of one, and you know gives you like a you know like a, a quite an accurate number. So, yeah. So I mean, that's that's the stats I look at, like you know during the game week. Uh, you know when I'm looking at or making the transfers. Um, I mean, w I mean when the game week finishes, I'll, I'll probably just like you know kind of I'll, I'll go into my team and I always I always set a bus team, like you know I always pick my captains and you know set a bench, you know just in case. Like I got on by a bus or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Quite. Is it, is it a little weird that everybody in the FPL community is like constantly contemplating death every week? I mean, maybe yeah. it's a healthy thing, but <laughs> yeah, you know, as long it's as not less FPL stressful than uh, FPL, right? <laughs> FPL is so stressful. <laughs> Life is yeah. less stressful. <laughs> yeah, for well, sure. Um, but yeah, in terms of like, yeah, so I mean, that, I'll do that, but I won't really look into my you know making transfers until kind of later on in the game week, but. Obviously, because I'm writing kind of during the week, I'm, I'm kind of you know subliminally doing research and looking into my team anyway. But um, yeah, when it actually comes to making my decisions, um, I'd, I'd, I'd look at you know those stats, and I'd also kind of look at. Um, I mean, I definitely favour long-term stats over short-term. Um, you know, especially for when you're making transfers over for like you know when you're when you're bringing the player and you're thinking you know five five or six game weeks ahead, uh, it's always definitely best to look at long-term stats. I really like that. Um, I just wanted to ask you then, how do you kind of think about historical data in the context of what's going on? Because, you know, like new players come to a club. So you look at someone like Buendia, you, you look at kind of his data at Norwich when he was in the Premier League, you know, teams are always evolving, new coaches arrive with different styles. Um, how are you kind of monitoring that? Because some people don't want to look at like championship data, let's say. So Mariner's algorithm on the kind of midfielders and defenders shows we've done so far, it doesn't have players from teams that have been promoted because he doesn't have the data for them last season in the league. So how do you feel about kind of players going to teams, coaches changing, things always kind of evolving? Like what is what is that doing for your game in the context of the modern game? Um, sorry, can you... I, I, can you repeat the question? I don't really understand. Yeah, so, so essentially, like, are you ever kind of combining stats to get a full picture painted? So, like, will you look at, say, um, Aston Villa stats last season and then combine that with Buen Buendia's stats at kind of Norwich? Yeah, yeah. And then would you overlay them together almost in a way? So, like, yeah. is that reliable? Like, what do you do in those scenarios when there isn't data for your stats decision? Well, I, th I mean, I think there always is. I mean, for, for example, like for a championship, I look at FBREF. Um, you know, that shows championship data and when so for example you, you mentioned Boendia so I did have a look at his stats you know for um uh for Norwich last season and you know he created the most chances out of you know everyone in the championship obviously got the most most assists uh, I think he got something like 15 goals and 15 assists so yeah so when I look at that like I'd, I'd look at a player who has amazing stats for you know a, a poor team uh, and also uh, Boendia also for example had one season in the Premiership as well with Norwich, uh, you know, two years ago when they got, put, when they got uh, relegated. And even in that season, I think Norwich scored like the least goals um, out of everybody. Um, and but he still managed to get you know some good attacking returns. So yeah, so I, I'd look at that and I think he's going to a team like Villa, who he's obviously going to you know create chances, and you know his chances are probably going to get put away more often. So um, yeah, so for for a, for a scenario like that, I'd you know that's what I'd look at, but. Um, I'd, I'd always, I mean, I, I, I don't think I'd try and kind of determine how a player is going to fit into like you know a certain team because you, you don't, you, you can probably, I mean, you can never really kind of guess that. Uh, it's really, I mean, the only person who can is the manager. So 
I think the, the best thing you could do is look at the stats. I think you can get stats for championship players and other players and like you know almost anywhere on the, on the internet. So when you what I would do is look at the, look at the the player stats. I mean, you also have to kind of apply some sort of uh, depreciation for the player coming into like the Premier League. Like for example, from the Championship to the Premier League. Of course, he's not going to get the same attacking returns he did, uh, you know, playing in the Championship. Yeah, so you kind of do have that, you know, in the back of your head, but it's just something you kind of need to. I guess that kind of comes down to your actual football knowledge, and you know, something that you have to try, you know, really kind of just kind of take a little punt on, if you know what I mean, and use your own kind of um, intuitiveness in that sense. Um, I like that. I like, that like a nice like place to fit the eye test. To be perfectly honest, I, I think it's just really used for the eye test. I guess so. Yeah, I think I guess that would, would become handy. I think I think that's a similar situation with Sancho as well because he's he's got like amazing stats. If you look at his kind of goals and assists uh, ratio, he's um, I mean phenomenal. Um, but like obviously, you know, coming from the Bundesliga to the Premier League, uh, you know, I think you, you do have you will have to apply some sort of depreciation on him as well. Um, and you know, we saw what happened with Timo Werner <laughs> obviously last season. Uh, you know, he was a world beater. Uh, well, you know, for I think a, a big a big change with uh, with Sancho when he comes to the Premier League is you know having one of the fastest players on the planet to pass the ball to in Holland is quite an advantage. So you can he can pass the ball in the space and and be pretty sure that Holland will, will get there. He's exactly. not going to have that United, um, and that could be a that could present a learning curve for him. Yeah, exactly. And I think these sort of things is. You, you can never really kind of pinpoint so it's just again i think you need to kind of use your own as you said gabe um you know that's probably where, where the eye test comes in handy in, in these sort of situations or you know I, I guess you can you know just kind of make a rough estimation uh you know maybe minus 10 or 15 percent of, yeah. of what you got uh in, in this bundesliga figures you know something like that but yeah it, it kind of makes him a makes him like a tough pick if you know what i mean because yeah. he's not important to just a shout out to FB Ref that you mentioned as well. So great free site with lots of data for some yeah, people yeah. who perhaps can't afford, like say, memberships to things yeah. like Hub and Fix and Scout. So it's a nice option, I think, especially for other leagues. It's going to give you a wealth of information. And kind of aside from that, then, so let's say for Premier League data or FPL specifically, what's your kind of most trusted content sources, and how do you stay objective? Where, when there's so much kind of information in the community, just even on Twitter in the form of threads or people sharing mm -hmm. stats they've delved into, um, you know, there's a bandwagon kind of every week, right, for a different player. And what do you yeah. do to avoid the hype? Because you say you're quite patient. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, in terms of like, you know, content resources, it's got to be the one only fans football hub. So that's all you need. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> we just need those articles, to be honest. We don't even need the rest. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you know, um, yeah, honestly, like, I mean, a lot of fans football sites are great. You know, you're talking about Hub, you've got um, FPL Review as well, which is a great site. I mean, seeing in terms of, in, in terms of, like, kind of, you know, trying to cut out the noise, like, what I found is that I really don't um, try and get involved in, you know, kind of team conversations, uh, you know, on Twitter. Because, I mean, for example, if I put my, my team out and, um, on Twitter and you know ask for opinions or thoughts on the transfers, you're gonna get ten different answers, you know, from like ten different people. So I think that's probably the one of the worst things you could do. So I, I try and stay stay out the kind of conversations on the main timeline and I kind of stick to certain accounts that you know that I'd speak to um in, in terms of you know like maybe like you know five or six accounts that I would actually talk about my, my transfer decisions. And I feel that has really really helped me because it kind of blocks out all the noise, kind of brings you know everything kind of into perspective. And, you know, looking at things like uh, I mentioned earlier, like, you know, Mikhail Topbam's algorithm and fplreview.com. Looking at these websites, it's, it helps decision making so much because, I mean, they've got, they've got like, you know, seasons and seasons of, of you know, past data. And they kind of use that to, like, you know, you know, like uh, compute and make predictions for, you know, like, you know, the next five or six game weeks. And they're really, really accurate. Um, and if you, if you just look at, for example, Mikel's, um, you know, rank history, you'll see he's, he's got a fantastic history. So I, mean, I think the, for, for me, um, I think following this process is, it's, firstly, it's, it's a, a lot more stress-free, honestly, like, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, and I know decisions and, you know, kind of 
talking about it and, and getting different answers from different people's on, on, different people on Twitter. I just think kind of using this methodology of just you know keeping your circle small. You know, speak to a few set of managers who you know that they you know they, they know their stuff. You know, it's, you know, discuss your decisions with them and look at models. Uh, speaking of those, you know, those models you mentioned, um, FPL review and all, and, and that. Are there any other um, optimization tools that that you use? And if, you know, you, you said that that data part and the kind of technology behind it um, is one of the things that's kind of revolutionized the game in your eyes. Yeah. So, which what are some of those tools that that you use? You mentioned well, uh, Mikkel's algorithm, and I and I know Tom from WGTA is going to be using that for to pick his captain this season. Uh, yeah. Mariner, Mariner has his captaincy metric, which uh, I think it got about eighty percent success rate last season. Yeah. Um, so, what tools do you use? I mean, in terms of actually optimization tools, I don't really use any, right? Because I will use. I mean, I think right now optimization tools are really, really kind of at an early stage. So, the only, I mean, I do use the one on fpowerview.com, but I kind of use it as. A, more of as a kind of as a reference point i wouldn't use it to like you know totally you know um base my decisions on it's like more of a reference point that's good to because i think right now is they're at a really early stage so they're probably not as good as they could be but um you know in terms of actually making decisions um yeah i mean it's as i said like looking at the looking at the models for your captain captain decisions is is, is a great way to success i did the last season you know and it worked really well um and you know i know a lot of other people who kind of use those same tools and you know have had great ranks um in the mm -hmm. past few years so tell us a little bit more about your process app though so let's say when the game updates once the game week one deadline ends and um, you've already kind of told us that you are mm -hmm. setting a bus team which hibbo doesn't believe in he actually keeps his old captain so he does the opposite mm -hmm. he believes that if you pick a captain on a bus team before deciding who your definite captain is for the next game mm -hmm. week it's bad luck so he's like the proponent of the alternate kind of chaos-free equivalent of bus team that was proposed by always cheating originally. So it's like Hibo's yeah. created a net that whole equivalent, which is the opposite. Just don't touch your team, leave the wrong bench. What, what do you feel about that? I always feel like I might get hit by a bus. So I'm on your school. Yeah, school. exactly. I mean, I think he's he's a lot braver than me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, like, obviously, the, 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 bus, the bus thing is more like a be honest like a psychological thing it's just kind of something you do you know it's just like a, a precaution really that you've got in the back of your head but yeah i mean in, in terms of like you know once for example the, the question you asked once game week one ends i mean usually i'll just kind of as i said i'll set my bus team you know i'll kind of start doing like you know my research for the articles that i write, I write weekly for hub and you know w while i'm doing that you're kind of subliminally picking up you know information as you go along um it's only really kind of I'd say Thursday, Friday, or Wednesday, Thursday, depending on when the deadline is, Friday or Saturday, that I really start looking into my team and you know start looking at which transfers I want to make. Um, so I'm, yeah. So I, I really don't like making you know decisions early. I mean, I mean the start of the season, I'd say probably game makes you know up, up until the second international break. Um, it's probably when I would make the earliest transfers because there's no midweek games, there's no Champions League. But uh, once the China Champions League and FA Cup and all the other kind of um, you know midweek games start coming in, uh, I really make my transfers as late as possible. So, I mean, obviously that uh, that makes sense and it's and it's in line with your kind of patient approach. Um, but do price fluctuations play a role in your decision making, Abdul? Um, do you ever go early with transfers and like early on in the season? Yeah. Kind of Tom Stevenson spoke about that last week. Yeah, no, I, I don't pay much attention to uh, to price fluctuations. To be honest, um, I, I don't. I don't believe it's as important as people make out. Um, I, I do think it's obviously better to have a higher team value, obviously, because you know when it comes to your second wild card, you've you've got more money to play with. But um, as I said, so I mean, I, I'd say if, if I was making early transfers, it's usually at the start of the season. You know, when it's kind of less risk involved. Uh, you know, less risk for your players getting injured, you know, from midweek games because, you know, they're not really playing. So the only way they can really get injured is, you know, like, you know, through training, which is unlikely. Or actually nowadays, you know, you've got the COVID as well. So obviously you need to factor that in as well. But yeah, um, I mean, the second half of the season or maybe, you know, like I'd say after game week 10, 12, once the midweek games and I really kind of, I'd say probably ignore team value altogether. 
Um, I really do focus on, you know, making my transfers, you know, in, in the best, with, with the best and most information I, c I can possibly get. Um, so that's as late as possible. I mean, usually, um, you know, I'd say probably 95% of my transfers are made after the press conferences. Mm. That's um, really interesting because obviously last week, Tom Stevenson and I, we kind of both agreed that although we tried to kind of wait till as late as possible, um, early in the season when the prices are most volatile with the kind of active managers being at its highest before the drop-offs inevitably yeah. when they do badly at the start, um, that's kind of when you might get a 0.3 mil swing in one game week. Um, someone will go up the maximum amount or down the maximum amount, especially if they've got a very high ownership. So it's yeah. interesting that for you, actually, team value, although obviously it's nicer to have more, you 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 kind of understand that more team value doesn't mean more points so you're again far yeah. more patient and you're kind of you're kind of yeah. avoid that noise you won't get distracted by it definitely and i think i think kind of sacrificing your team value for you know optimal transfer decisions you know in terms of what i mean by that is you know waiting as long as possible uh, and getting the most information you can before making the transfers definitely outweighs having a having a higher team value um second for the second wild card or for the second half of the season definitely that's that's fascinating um i think i'll definitely see what i'm going to do this season i've done a late wild card last year which was kind of like yeah. in the final week we could and that's probably the latest i've ever played it and uh, i don't know how i felt about that i might try to go earlier to catch the price rises so maybe not take hits or do early transfers in a game week yeah. but let's say when there's a good fixture swing or in between any of the free international breaks so i think the kind of game week four eight and twelve or something like that um maybe target one of those so i'll be going early because i'm on wild card but it's more that i'm doing an early wild card rather than doing a free transfer on a monday and then that player mm. gets injured in the kind of midweek game as you say um, in mm. terms of when you are looking to bring in a player then so just talking about transfers like what kind of fixture length are you looking at so are you just buying them for the one game to maximize returns on a per mm. game week basis are you bringing them in for a captaincy essentially in that sense or are they kind of four weeks five weeks six weeks like what's the period you look at over the fixture ticker before you commit yeah. to someone 99 percent of the time it's, it's probably like about four or five game weeks um i don't think you should look any longer than that or i mean yeah for four to five game weeks is probably standard but obviously sometimes you know you, you see a player have, has got like you know eight or nine good fixtures in a row but obviously that's a bonus but generally four to four to five game weeks in advance I, i've never kind of bring in a player you know for for one or two game weeks you know very very rarely um you know i do something like that um but yeah generally four to five game weeks i think it's a good kind of it's like a in the middle um you know in terms of you know look you know it's not it's not too short it's not too long it's nice in the middle and i think it's kind of a, it's a good it's a good kind of reference point uh you know to make your transfers for So, um, <laughs> sorry, pardon me. Uh, Abdul, I wanted to know uh, how you felt about your chip usage uh, and your strategy last season, and if you thought it was successful. Um, what was your approach? And do you, you know, is it something that you, you think about going into this season or not, not really uh, until the time comes? No, I mean, like, I know some people, like, you know, kind of plan their wild cards, uh, you know, like the, they might have, like, you know, the first or second international break in a year, Matt. Um, but I don't. I don't really do that. I mean, I'm really open to using my, my wild card early. Most seasons I've, I've used it early. Um, um, last season I didn't actually because it was a totally different situation last season with, with double game weeks and that. So I think I used it in game week. I've got it here. I've got it, I used it in game week 16 last um, mm -hmm. last season, uh, and then kind of used my free hit in, in 18, and then the bench boost in 19. So I worked out quite well because I went from like 37k to 5k uh, in that time. So it was it was a popular it was a, a successful chip strategy, but usually, uh, like in a, in a normal season, um, I'd, I'd I'd I use a wild card quite early. Not because I plan to use it, because mostly I need I need to use it because get, pre game week one, you that's when you've got the kind of least information. Um, so you're it's when you're guessing the most. So a lot of the time you'll probably get it wrong, in game week one, and then you need to kind of use your wild card to fix that. And I, I have no qualms about doing that. Um, you know, it's, it's proved a successful strategy over the years. So, yeah, I mean, to answer the question, I, I don't have like a set time, uh, you know, like, a, you know, kind of an, an earmark time of when I'm going to use a wildcard, but I'm, I'm really open to just using it whenever I need it.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, we we touched on that on the on the Friday uh, matchup show. Uh, how the, the biggest delta in information is at the beginning of the season. I mean, we think we know a lot. We've done a lot of research. Yeah, but we don't. The season hasn't happened. So yeah, exactly so makes sense. Exactly. And um, so this is an odd one, but I feel like it'll be interesting to get your perspective on this um, because I'd never really considered it until this preseason. Um, do you think in the community there's sometimes an overemphasis on the kind of the value of chips as a whole? Because sometimes we kind of plan out, let's say, five to ten weeks of uh, kind of transfers. We don't go and target things we know are kind of factually apparent now. So let's say in game week two you find out things are going to be very different. So you might want to just wild card out of a bad team you have because you're waiting for a fixture swing in game week 12. Do we sometimes kind of overemphasize the return that I might get when we then use that chip? when in reality like i used the bench boost last week with free uh, last season with free leads players and that was like six points yeah. right so it's like at the end of the day like was it worth kind of changing my entire plans over a 10 to 20 week period just on these chips or are they genuinely what they're all all they're cracked yeah. up to be i mean that's it's a, it's a hard question it's a good question nima um I, I don't think anybody can actually kind of accurately answer that because i don't know i mean I mean, the kind, the kind of, the, I'd say the template, you could call it the template way to use your, your chips is like, you know, you use the bench boost in the double game week, uh, you use a triple captain in the double game week, and you use your free hit in the black game week, right? So, like, you know, that's probably, and it is a good strategy to use, um, but it's, it's definitely not the only way to do it. And um, I think, I mean, everyone's team is different. I mean, you know, and, you know, sometimes you might need to use your wild card, you might, you know, you might have an opportunity to use your bench boost. You know when it's not you know when it's not in fashion when it's not the kind of conventional way um but yeah i think that's more an individual um on on the individual team but i think generally like i've in my like you know since the chips have been here i've i've used always used my belt card um sorry always use my bench boost and triple captain and double game week and a three hit and either either a double game week or a black game week and um it's always i mean mo mostly uh, it's what for me had success with it so the way i see it is um if if it's working i mean if it's not broke then kind of don't fix it uh you know that, that's for me personally like I, I would go down that same route again but i wouldn't tell people that it's the only way to to play the game yeah no i think i totally agree on that so i i kind of use all my chips like you probably only in double game weeks and blank game yeah. weeks and even stuff like using a free hit on a double game week to attack it rather than wild carding the week before and bench pressing the week after and that exactly. was a new thing for me but covid meant that last year was a bit of a strange one and people did lots of different and wonderful strategies and obviously shout out to ben krillin as well so another one of the legends who got me yeah. into the community was as i said you kind of bakar and ben krillin were like the initial three i think that i used to follow for years and on the kind of reddit forums before i joined twitter about a year ago so it's been an interesting journey on Twitter for the last year. I'm really excited what the next few years are going to hold for all of us together and on the hub ship, right? As you say, yeah. kind of writing there. So um, I, I, I kind of want to move on to some stuff that actually came up in the chat earlier. I know Gabe wanted to ask you about this. So I thought this was a good time to bring it up. Um, I'm going to go out of the OR history. I think most people who've come in and out have hopefully seen your rank. I'll pull it up again later, but I'd like to bring it just to kind of us talking now and a bit more intimate, as I was saying, kind of a fireplace chat. So, I'm going to pull up the first question from Donnie, which I know is similar to kind of what Gabe wanted mm -hmm. to know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So for, for the podcast listeners, I'll, I'll read it out. Uh, Donnie asked, Abdul, uh, does EO, effective ownership, affect your decision-making in any way? Since I became familiar with it last season, uh, it can negatively impact decision-making by not captaining uh, or not transferring in a player. What are your thoughts, Abdul? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um, EO has become such a, a large part of the game now. Um, I think it, I think it does affect my decision making. Um, like I think it's a really useful tool to have because you can use it to like you know see you know whether you want to kind of you know play defensively or play offensively, and it gives you that opportunity to actually you know make that decision. So yeah, um, it does it does affect my decision making. And for me, I think the kind of introduction of EO. Um, you know, has been a positive thing for for FPL. And I, I know a lot of people probably disagree with that, but I, th I, th I think it's a good thing. Hmm. Nice. Let me just pull off this question now because um, I've done the mistake of I didn't put the ticker at the bottom to start with, so I didn't say about the podcast down there, but it's there. <laughs> um, 
we're back. I will change the ticker soon to threaten people for some more likes. And I said this last time when Tom came on, I kind of said, we're not actually going to get to the Q&A section um, where they can ask you questions until we get to at least the 50 likes. So we're on 41. We're almost there. I hope you guys are tweeting out the shows live and, you know, let's get Abdul free so he can go back to his family tonight and not be held hostage like Hibbo. And I, I did want to like elaborate on, on Abdul's point because you don't, you don't hear, or I haven't heard many people actually say that uh, effective ownership and, and the knowledge of it um, is actually a good thing or that, like wholeheartedly support that it's a good thing for FPL. I guess what advice would you give to, to players who, um, other than <laughs> like they could ignore it, of course, but it's difficult to ignore sometimes when you're trying to yeah. be in a community and it's part of the conversation. What advice would you give to people that to whom it negatively affects? Like it sounds like perhaps, um, who was it that sent that question in? Donny, Donny FBI. Donny. It sounds like yeah. Donny is negatively impacted. So, what advice would you have for Donny? Um, I'd say, I mean, if uh, I don't know what he means by neg negative impacted, I mean, is it maybe it's affecting his decisions in terms maybe, of maybe enjoyment of the game, Abdul? So, no, like, okay. let's say there's two players over 100% yeah. here, you've captain one. Oh, of them, okay. Okay, you yeah. like one player, but you go with the other player because it's more, you know, a higher effective action. I can, I can understand that. that. I can understand that. Um, how it would kind of maybe kind of you know kill the enjoyment a bit with the, with the game but i mean if it's for that reason then you, i mean there's no other choice but to just ignore it completely um i mean i mean what, what else can you do really um you know if, it, if it's gonna affect you in that way then you have to ignore it um otherwise i mean it's it's here to stay now, isn't it? We thought something that we could kind of brush under the carpet. So, and it's a shield, right? So you could see it as, oh, I lost, like you know, um, it's a one hundred and ten percent EO, and therefore I lost ten percent of the points against me, even though I own this player. But yeah. you could have lost one hundred and ten percent of those points exactly. against you and derailed yeah. your whole season. So, I, I agree with you. I'm also a template player, as we exactly. said all night, and I'd rather kind of have that shield on my back and take yeah. my punt elsewhere, not necessarily on my captains, but in my kind of six to eight million range yeah. player that might be an exciting mid like a Greenwood or Jota this year, maybe a Saka, someone who does something we're not expecting, a Rafinha, Buendia, any of these guys. Yeah, right? so, yeah. There's so many. That's where my punt is going to be. So um, how do you then, on that note, eliminate kind of risk in your game week one team? Because, you know, I've seen a lot of drafts with players that have just joined a new club, They've come up from a different league. We've talked about the likes of Sancho. Uh, we talked about Buendia, Sar already. So, like, do you have any hard and fast rules where you're kind of avoiding players from, say, promoted size or any foreign signings? And do you wait and see how they perform first? Or, like, what do you do? Like, what are your rules there and your uh, mitigating risks, sorry, in your game? Yeah. Team? So, my game make one tier is as safe, or as safe as we can probably get. Um, it's one of my kind of rules is just play a really really template um you know have all your kind of main price points your premium players in, in your midfield uh you know so you can you can switch about easily but m most of my players you know in game week one are, are probably the highest owned players um oh. what, what, one thing i usually try and avoid is as you said like new players to the league you know unknown quantities oh. but saying that i mean for example uh last season my gaming one team was really template um you know i had like all the main players salah bruno you know, Salah captain, Trent, um, and then, but I had Timo Werner, who who was, you know, an unknown quantity, but, I mean, the reason I picked him was because he was, um, he was one of the highest, like, owned forwards in the game, or if not the highest owned forward, I can't remember, but he was really high, highly owned, so he was, he was a risk to go without, even though, like, you know, he was unproven in the, the PL, he was still a risk to go without, because if he banned, you didn't have him, you know, you'd, you'd lose a lot of ground. I think this year, similarly, is with Ivan Tony. He's the second highest one player in the game, you know, for, uh, you know, promoted side Brentford. And, um, you know, in the moment, at the moment, I've got him in, in both my drafts. So, yeah, I think usually I go safe as possible. But, I mean, you know, sometimes with these decisions, um, you know, like picking a Tony or a Werner kind of may seem to contradict that. But because their ownership is so high, um, I think they're relatively safe picks. That's, that's really interesting how the kind of EO then comes into what you're doing with the mitigating risk. So you're kind of having some risky assets, but they're not in the positions where it matters for your captaincy, like your premiums. And yeah. there's other assets within a pricing point. So I think for anyone who hasn't seen some of the previous preseason episodes we've done, we did a kind of strategy special, I think episode two potentially, 
all three about team structure. And we looked at loads of different team structures where there's kind of three, four, threes, three, five, twos, four, four, twos. And, and it's fascinating, like the kind of entire class of players you might miss out on if they bang in game week one because you went for one yeah. structure or another. Um, what, what do you kind of, do you commit to that then? So let's say you did go for a heavy back line and let's say you got Robertson and Trent, so seven and a half, seven million. What happens if, let's say, now a seven or eight million midfielder asset performs and you can't get your second 4.5 mid, for example, up there? Like, would you take that hit in game week two because it's early in the season? Or would you just kind of stick to your initial strategy and hope it pans out over the four or five week period? And do you kind of get panic and knee jerk, essentially, is what I'm asking? Like, do you find yourself knee jerking in those scenarios? No, I I don't think I would because, I mean, you just have to think of why you picked those players in the first place. I mean, you didn't pick them for one game week and, you know, one. I mean, one game week, I mean, very, very unlikely I'd make a, that sort of move, you know, bringing in, um, you know, taking out Robertson, for example, for, you know, a 6.5 or 7.5 midfielder who kind of performed in game week one. It's just one game week. I mean, I definitely kind of stick to my plan of, you know, keeping that, you know, keeping those players over, um, you know, the, the time period, which, you know, I expected them to, which was four or five game weeks. So, no, I, I mean, uh, as I said before, I think that's one of my one of my strengths is being kind of patient, and you know, kind of waiting it out, and you know, being patient with my players, even if they're not performing. Sometimes, um, you know, if, you know, sometimes players will go through like you know four or five games without without scoring, but they've still got the stats there, the stats are backing up, but it's just, it's just not the output. Um, so I'm good at kind of keeping hold of those types of players, and you know, um, and knowing they will eventually come good. So yeah, so yeah, so I'd say no. I, I don't think I'd be I'd be doing that in game week two. Um, but maybe you know if it was happening for say three or four game weeks and you know there was a kind of big trend, then then I'd then I'd look at it and maybe you know pop at the wild card if, if needed. Um, just just really really quickly, I want to get a little question in here about um, you know the, there's nothing like you know it's never just about one game week, but there's nothing like game week one. Right? Do you so? Do you have like a like a target rank for game week one? Like somewhere you want to be, or you know, a range, or not lower than? Um, no, you know, I can't say how I ever thought of that. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, I'd say the first like ten game weeks. I mean, the rank is really kind of irrelevant because yeah. people are using their chips, people are using the wild cards, the triple captains. So the, your rank is really inflated or deflated, you know, depending on if you if you use chips or not. So I really don't concentrate on rank so much, um, you know, in the early part of the season because it's not really a true rank, especially since the chips have been introduced. So no, I, I can't say I would do that. I, I just try and, you know, get the best team out as possible and get the highest points, you know, uh, per game week. Mm-hmm. I think um, there is some chat in the comments actually from some of the listeners. I just want to quickly pull up what they're saying about what we're discussing. So. I think we've got John Chappell, who's a long-time listener of the show. He's saying every player is kind of one minus four away, and he doesn't really understand the kind of the price structure stuff, like why you would be concerned with that or why you might stick to kind of the players you've picked, as you say, because you trust them and you're not going to take the minus four to change structure. Um, mm-hmm. I think I'm more on your side of the conversation where I, I generally will just stick with my players and see them through, or I'll play my bench player if one of my 11 is injured. Um, mm-hmm. I actually like having two free transfers, so a lot of the time I find myself rolling. And I kind of ask every manager, are you someone who will take a minus four hit or do you like to roll a transfer? And it's always fascinating because there's kind of, everyone seems to go one of two ways. So I think John probably goes to take a hit approach and we probably go for the keep it um, saved. Gabe, I know you might be someone who leans more towards take the hit. So last season yeah. you took a hit to sell someone, Alonso or Dinia, like one week after you got them, he said, look, I don't want them anymore. I've decided I was wrong. I'm just going to take the hit immediately. So tell us how that happened. Yeah, thing. let us know about that because you seem to maybe agree with John more where you would take the hit, whereas me and Abdul, we wouldn't, we would roll. It's. I think it's part of the thrill and the joy I get in the game um, where, and it's just ruthless. Like the players are almost like, uh, you know, as, as quickly as you brought them in, you, you can take them out. I remember it was uh, at FPL Joe from uh, FP, uh, FPL Expectations. He and I, we both brought in uh, Alonso that game week, and, and Alonso was benched, and then he was benched again or something like that. And, and that was when you know, like when you know you've made a mistake or when you're convinced of it, then 
I think the sooner you can correct it, the the better. Even if it hurts when you pull that Band-Aid off. So, so it is a bit of a Band-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> I guess let's um, let's try and get into the drafts that you sent across, Abdul. I think that's kind of where we want to go next. And I know you sent us two teams that you've got. Um, we're going to talk through some of the players you've picked for the early part of the season. Before that, I'm going to check. So we're on 46 likes now. Um, we're getting closer to the Q&A. So I'm hoping that while you talk about your two draft teams, we'll get those final four likes. Um, and I'm slowly starting to kind of make some threats on Twitter too about Hibbo. So it, if he doesn't help us while he's preparing for his interview, get to the 50 likes. <laughs> he may not be allowed back onto the ship on Friday, but um, sorry if you are listening, mate. Um, so let me kind of, before we just go ahead, I'm going to talk a little bit about a partnership the channel has. So I think we officially announced it a few weeks ago. So I'm going to take us out of here for a second to give us just 30 seconds for a drink and have a little listen. So I will say kind of, hashtag ad so we actually have started kind of working with fantasy football fix um since the pre-season episodes and in that time we've um essentially decided that we can give you guys 65 percent off and a free strategy guide worth 10 pounds so i use their transfer trends articles uh, sorry transfer trends tools to look at my article for hub as well and in there we look at the players being sold and transferred in and the combinations between them and analyze the percentage split so it's a really nice tool um they have an app there's been a lot of debate about whether the elite 11 is cheating um nick trigger lips friend of the pod he he wants them all banned um all 11 managers including mr black um before we do kind of talk about that later on i just want to say fix is obviously a great tool i'll show you a kind of slide later where you can use the net that whole code and obviously we get a little kickback towards our cost but without further ado let's actually get to your kind of draft teams i think uh, abdul and i'd like to have you kind of talk us through the first one here so i'm going to pull this slide back up onto screen um this was the first one for the podcast listeners do you mind just also reading out from the back like who is in the team yeah so this was this is my first initial draft uh, which i've done um and I, I don't know this season i found that i found that being you know picking my team quite easy um you know a bit less stressful than two seasons but yeah, so in goal, I've got Sanchez, uh, three in defence, uh, Trent, Shaw, and Dinia. Uh, midfield, Rafinha, Bruno, Salah, Buendia. Uh, up front, DCL, Watkins, and Ivan Tony. And then uh, reserve keeper, Foster, and then Ailing, Brownhill, and Beltman on the bench. Um, so, yeah, so that was my, my initial draft. I, I still like this draft. Um, and I, I, I just feel. Um, I mean, do, do you want me to talk about this draft and my current draft as well, or do you want me to just kind of... Yeah, I think maybe maybe start with this one. But if, if you feel more natural, I could actually switch over to the next one on screen as well. I just think it might confuse some of the podcast listeners here. Yeah. Both okay, well, lineups a bit. Let's keep, keep it on this one for now then. Yeah, so I just I just really like this team because I think, I mean, what Watkins is, you know, a great pick for you know, his first three games. I think I think most of these picks are, are, are template and really, and will be high owned and, you know, I've got good fixtures and, you know, they'll be in a lot of people's teams. So I don't mind that at all. The biggest risk I've got in there is um, Ivan Tony and, and, and Buendia. Um, I did mention earlier about why I thought, uh, you know, Ivan Tony was a relatively safe pick because of his ownership. And also due to the fact that another reason as well is from game week five, uh, Norwich's fixtures really, really kind of, you know, take a turn, you know, for the better. And, you know, Brentford's kind of go downhill. So Tony Tapuki is, uh, you know, a good little safety net, um, you know, in that sense as well. So there is, a you know, a bit of, uh, I've got a bit of a safety net with, with Ivan Tony, but I just think with, with his ownership, he's, he's relatively safe. Verendia, I think, is quite risky. Um, but again, I really, really like him. And it looks like Grealish is off the city as well. So... I think him going to City uh, will make Buenda a, a better FPL option because kind of he'll probably get most of the set pieces. He'll be the main playmaker. Um, you know, I probably will make Villa a poorer team overall, but I think as an FPL option, uh, it'll make him it'll make him better. I think uh, what I what I'm noticing here is the way you balance um, risk with over with ownership. So if it is a risky pick, like a player that's recently promoted or something like that, uh, that you what makes you more comfortable about about that pick is the high is the high ownership of that player yeah uh, exactly uh, this replies so, so good it was the same with Werner last season as well you know he was right uh, quantity but he was he was he, he was in i think Werner started off at nine million last season which was you know from his stats and from his you know 
his goals and assists from you know from Germany that was a bargain, and he was highly owned as well. So at the time it was a no-brainer to pick Werner. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A lot of us made that mistake for sure. Yeah. I think one question I have here is um, obviously we've seen kind of Buendia and Watkins together, um, and I know just a little bit. Um, would you ever consider kind of holding on to one of them through the bad fixtures? So someone like Watkins, people are saying on Twitter that he did well in the reverse fixtures. Um, I think they need to remember as well that the 7-2 versus the Liverpool, that's probably not a common occurrence. So maybe some of those stats are inflated in that period. But either way, they're saying he did great against the tougher opponents. And would you be tempted to kind of maybe only sell one of the two? And if so, which one would you keep after game week four in this team? Yeah, definitely I'd keep Watkins because he, he is a proven asset in the Premier League. I mean, yeah, people did, I mean, yeah, he did have, I mean, the, the Liverpool game was an anomaly, but he did also return against like of Arsenal, Spurs and um, Man City as well. He got attacking returns. So if, if you look at his stats, he, he get. I mean, he's not only like, you know, got a good goal scoring shots, he, he gets a lot of shots off in the box because he, he's like the, kind of the main man up front for Villa. So he's always, you know, the most furth- furthest forward. Gets a lot of shots off in the box. He's he also um, is is good at creating chances as well. So if you look at his like kind of chance creation for a forward, is good as well. So I think he's a, a really good all round player. And for seven point five million uh, in those first three fixtures, great pick. And yeah, I, I, I definitely I wouldn't have any qualms about holding Watkins, you know, through the tough fixtures. Buendia is a different story. Um, again, I'm not really confident on him. Um, I'd say I, I do have a good feeling about him, but. Um, you know, I, I can't really back that with any kind of st- statistical evidence. So, wh- one thing I wanted to ask you here is how, um, when when you play the kind of, I guess the the safe template game, you're playing a little bit of the ownership game, right? The um, and how how worried are you that if a if a highly owned player doesn't perform, say in week one, that there's a mass exodus and it causes his uh, price to drop? Yeah, I mean, again, like, as a, just be something that it would depend on the situation. It would depend on the placement. Like, I mean, for example, if it was if it was Buendia, uh, you know, who kind of didn't perform, and um, there was another, I don't know, maybe like, I don't know, um, Tony. Who sorry? Tony, Tony as well. Say, say, you know, you can you can envision Tony blanking against Arsenal. Yeah, I mean, I mean, or, I think Buendia even away to Watford. Potentially. Yeah, I, I guess it depends on the replacements and who the replacement is. I mean, if I feel that the replacement is, um, you know, better prospect, then, you know, I, I, I might make the move, but I, I don't think I would. I mean, I could, as I said, I mean, um, I, I definitely stick with Buendia through, through the game week three, no matter what, because of how good his fixtures are. Uh, and I think I'd probably do the th- same with Tony, because I, again, as I said, he's still got that pookie move in, in game week five and he's 0.5 cheaper so even if Tony does fall in price then you know I, I could still kind of afford that move so mm-hmm. yeah I think these type of decisions are really kind of dependent on the actual situation but I think in most cases um I just kind of stick with them mm-hmm. um and just kind of trust my instincts or trust my initial decision making I, I really like I just want to say Lucas Dean shout because with kind of Rodriguez being rumored to want out the club and um, other allegations made at players from the club um, in their own statement about the investigation. Like, you know, maybe he's going to be in a lot more set pieces this season than we're expecting. And I know that I think it's FPL Tornado. Yeah. They they sent in some advice to our kind of show we did about new coaches at clubs. And we had a look yeah. and he reckoned Decore at that price point of, I think it's 5.5, could play quite an interesting role as well mm. further forward on the pitch and recreate his Watford heroic. So I would say if there's one takeaway I'd do is let's keep the Corey on our watch list and see how that goes. But <laughs> I do like Dean in the yeah. meantime in your draft. Um, do, do you have any other thoughts on this draft, Gabe, or should we look at the 4 3 yeah. that is the more recent kind of draft that Abdul's done? I think we can move on. Cool. So yeah, so this is the 4 3 3 I'll read it out quickly for the listeners. We have Sanchez at the back, uh, Trent Alexander-Arnold and Robertson. We have Lucas Dean again and Luke Shaw. We have a midfield free of Rafinha, Fernandez, and Salah. And then a forward free of Calvert-Lewin, Watkins and Tony again. So the bench is Foster, Brownhill, Gilmore and Manquillo in this one. Um, so I guess the main things, the talking points here are really the double Liverpool defence. Um, so you've put more money in the back line. You have two 4.5 mids. And you're still kind of backing Tony, but I think we understand why, due to all the kind of earlier conversations about yeah. not taking risks against the template early on. And 
Yeah. So, what are your thoughts, kind of, there on the double Liverpool defense, and then the two four point five mids? Like, yeah. how do you feel yeah. about this team? So, with this team, I kind of just thought, you know, I just kind of ended up thinking and deciding that I preferred Robertson over Buendia because that's what the decision was, really. Uh, I just think, you know, Robertson's. I mean, Liverpool fixtures to start are amazing. Uh, you know, the first eight are really good. Robertson, a proven asset. You know, a lot more proven than, than Buendia, um, and. I really like this team because it's just, I mean, again, it's it's it's, it's really safe. Um, I keep saying that and it's, it probably sounds boring to a lot of people, but it's just really safe and, um, you know, it's, it covers all bases. Um, and and with, with Robertson, with that back line, I know, as, as you said, with the four, two 4.5 million midfielders, it's a bit risky in, in case, you know, one of the mid-price midfielders kind of start banging and I need to... Um, you know, maybe bring one of them in, but um, I'm, I'm happy to kind of, you know, stick with that back four, you know, for the first eight game weeks at least. So, yeah, that, that was the only decision, really. Uh, the, the main difference between the two two drafts was really kind of bringing in Robertson instead of instead of Buendia and then bringing in a 4.5 million midfielder um, instead of Buendia and then also downgrading um, development to, to a 4 million as well. And I think it's good because Brownhill and Gilmore should, you know, be guaranteed 90 minutes so they should be in you know a solid two points most weeks um so yeah this is this is where i am at the moment and um I, I've, I've been in this draft for like you know probably the past three or four days and i've, I've not changed at all um I'm, I'm, and i think the, the only reason the only way i can see this changing in a big way is if kane goes to city which is looking really likely now so yeah we'll see what happens when that when that goes through um, quick question for you here. So there's a couple of players missing in the forward line. So a kind of popular pick we see all over the Twitter template at the moment is Antonio and slightly less popular, but also gaining traction is Wilson. Um, obviously, yeah. they both have one thing in common, which is dodgy hamstrings. Um, I have said don't ever go with both in your game with one team. Otherwise, you're probably asking for, for punishment and you're a glutton for pain. But what do you feel about either of them? Like, do either of them come into your thinking? And if not, like, why not? Like, would you ever change any of the free strikers you've got in these two drafts to either of them? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think Watkins is is um, is nailed. I'd say. And, uh, Me too. DCL, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, DCL is, is expandable. I mean, he can easily become Watkins. Uh, sorry, he can easily become Antonio. Um, I mean, I like Wilson as well. To be honest, I mean. I love Antonio and Wilson. Antonio and Wilson. I definitely go Antonio first. Uh, if I was to get yeah. Wilson as well, it, it would be for Tony, you know, somehow. But um, yeah, I mean, DCL. He's he's by no means kind of nailed at the moment. I mean, you know, if uh, I mean, you know, we never know what the developments will be like over the past few weeks. Um, but I mean, if I need to find a point five somewhere, I have no kind of hesitation in getting rid of DCL, you know, for Antonio. And, so he's um, in my team as well, DCL at the moment, uh, and Watkins. But what's interesting is I had Tony, and I think it was a few yeah. days ago, I kind of spent an extra million to go to Antonio. So I've actually got Calvin yeah. doing Watkins and Antonio. And part of me kind of wonders, you know, do I actually go back to a Tony to start with? Backing against my own team, Arsenal, at Fantasy Football Fest in person <laughs> with 200 people who want to celebrate Arsenal's misery? Or do I get a <laughs> Tierney or Ben White into my team? back against yeah. Tony, watch him drop a few 0.1s and buy him for one of my strikers in game week two or three. Um, so that, I'm, I'm not sure which side of that debate I stand on yet, but I, I've kind of yeah. gone up to Antonio and it's interesting for you to say Antonio over Wilson first because that's kind of how I felt. Yeah. But um, yeah. I hadn't considered making money through Calvert-Lewin. He seems like a shoe-in for me right now just because I have a lot of excitement for how I think he will do and how consistent he is and proven at this level as you say he's kind of i like assets that i know what i'm getting with them and i feel like i do know with him um i am nervous about some of the creative players behind him missing and if that will have a bad impact on him but let's yeah. see kind of how these final preseason games go yeah. I, th I think with dcl um attacking wise i mean with, with rafa benitez and i think but we can be fairly sure they'll they'll show up in the defense and they'll have a better defense uh, i don't think we can be as sure um attacking wise so um, that's one of the reasons why um, you know I, I do really like him, but I think he I think because options we've got a seven point five like Antonio like like Wilson he is he is you know sacrificeable. Um, but yeah, I mean if I could find the extra one million to upgrade Tony to another seven point five, I would. But I just like the rest of that team so much, um, you know I can't really find the cash anywhere. 
the the other thing to consider is I, I I don't believe that Everton are done in the transfer market. Um, I I think there's more business for them. If they'll be looking for a right winger for sure, and and if if Ducouré is released through the midfield, I mean, you know, will, will the changes make Calvert Lewin even more um, appealing? And and then will will you want to sell him? You know, after them, so definitely yeah. one to keep an eye on. I think um, just on that note, we are at one hour twenty. I don't want to keep Abdul here forever. He's been very kind to honor us with his uh, presence. But um, unless there's anything else, Abdul, you want to add about this draft, I think we have quite a lot of um, fan RMTs. We had over 84 submissions. So you're, you're a very popular man. Everyone wants your time. Um, I'm sure you're never going to get tired of getting DMs saying thoughts question mark or tweets saying thoughts question mark, even if you announce that someone in your family has got a you know chronic illness, they'll still ask you what's your team. So people on the FPL Twitter community, be nice. Everyone's human. Um, they can't get back to all of you. And sorry in advance if we missed your team today. Um, but do tweet us and we will still give you our feedback after the show. So just kind of moving on to the next section, we're going to talk about obviously your teams as haulers that you've submitted. I picked 19 of them, as I say. It was done randomly. And I want to go straight into it. We're going to do about one minute max per team. I'll read them out, Abdul, for the podcast listeners. Mm -hmm. And you can give us a score out of 10 and I guess one thing you'd like or dislike about that team to justify the score. And, and don't worry, I saw Fergie scoring teams earlier on the Hub channel and he was brutal. To be honest, people in the chat, feel free to comment along because there were some very kind of mean and toxic people in his chat all telling <laughs> each person that submitted a team that they had a bad team and they should delete it. And so I hope our community of haulers are nicer people and we don't just shit on each other's drafts, but let's get going to it. So... First one is friend of the show, um, at Danube Joe. So he's got Martinez in goal with Wood as his sub. He has Trent Alexander-Arnold, Lucas Dean and Kufal. He has Eiling and Dunk as well. He also has Salah, Son, Harrison and Rafinha. And then he has Watkins, Iannaccio and Cavani. So first up, there's a Harrison and Rafinha double up. There is also the risks of Iannaccio and Cavani from a minutes point of view. Um, What's your score out of 10? And feel free to comment along in the chat, guys. Um, I, th I think I'm going to have to give this one like a 5.5 out of 6. I think he's got like too much money spread. I think he's going to have bench headaches every week. Um, you know, he's got five good defenders. You know, he's got four you know, good midfielders who you can play every week and three forwards as well. And again, yeah, Cavani minutes um, is a worry. I think Martinez is is overpriced this season. I can't see him kind of replicating the last season's form. So yeah, for that reason, I'd, I'd probably give this, probably give it a six. I, I do like the Harrison and, I mean, I don't mind the Harrison and Rafina double, but I think overall needs to spread the, the funds more, more optimally. I'm seeing some kind of 10 out of 10s from Andy Martin, um, Echo Tactician, <laughs> three times Leeds players. We're seeing a solid one out of 10 and a shocking team from my friend Tosh. Um, I don't know what's going on, but uh, there's a lot of too many leads in Cavani not nailed. It seems to be the conclusion from yeah. the chat. But the, the chat is quite polarized, I think, <laughs> like 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 the like our planet, it's like it, either it ones or, or tens. <laughs> It is, isn't it? Mm. So let's move on to the next team. So we have um, another friend of the show, so at FPL underscore architect. I think a couple of us are actually submitting pieces this season to his Twitter thread about transfer targets. So looking forward to competing with you there and on the captaincy panel as well. Um, so he has one million in the bank. He has double Man United attack. He's got Sanchez in goal with Foster on the bench. Trent Alexander-Arnold, Luke Shaw, Fafana. He has Salah, Fernandez, Greenwood and Rafinha. Antonio Watkins and Tony with a bench of Ailing Brownhill. And I'm going to try it again, but I, I say to the podcast listeners, I can only see the first five characters. There's a dot, dot, dot. It doesn't kind of fit on the screen, but it's an Omar Bombardelli, I think. And I hope I've said that mm -hmm. right. So what, what's your thoughts here, Abdul, on FPL Architects yeah, draft? Yeah, I really like this team, actually. Um, not too sure about Greenwood, um, but I think obviously with um, Rashford out now, he should be good for minutes. Um, but um, yeah, I, I really like this team. It's quite similar to my my first draft. I like the fact he's got Antonio and Watkins in there. Um, I'll probably give this. Um, I'll give it an an eight. I like it. Solid. I think the chat seems to be yeah. quite happy, but they're, they're not happy yeah. about the million in the bank, to say the least. Um, I guess that's where the Antonio could become a Wilson. But Wilson Antonio, as I said, the two of them together, it just seems mm. like 
asking for pain. Um, so we have another friend of the show, um, someone who actually had the pleasure of meeting in person at the FPL meetup a couple of weeks ago is at Benny underscore Blanco 40. Mm-hmm. Bit of a joker, um, notorious for his dad jokes. I think mm-hmm. many have muted him for his lack of humor, including Ben Krillin, who unfollowed him and famously then followed <laughs> him. And now Ben doesn't know what to do with his Twitter account that his life goal was achieved. So I hope you're not here live to give it back to me. Benny, do DM me if you take any anger to this so he has Havertz which I want to ask you about Abdul he also has Buendia and Watkins double up that we've discussed I think yeah. enough so far this show the rest of his team is Sanchez uh, Trent Dunk Fafana Salah Fernandez Buendia Havertz as we said Watkins Antonio Tony a bench of Manquillo Ailing Brownhill so so what are your kind of ratings here for Br- yeah. Benny friend of the show yeah Ben is uh, I love Benny's jokes by the way just uh, got a bit <laughs> I know I know the dad jokes but they always make me laugh but yeah, I actually like this team. Um, you know what? I really like his double Brighton defence. I've not seen many um, double Brighton defences, but I think that could really work. Um, I think the the only player I don't like in there um, is Havertz. I just I'm, I'm not I'm really not sure on him. I mean, I don't know where he is minutes wise. Um, I think he's got a bit of competition there. I mean, he's one of those players that you know he he could he could smash it, but at the same time, you no, know, he could he could just Know, flop as well, so I think he's quite in, quite unknown. But apart from Havertz, I like it. Um, I think I'll probably give this. Um, I, I give this an eight as well, just because he's. I really like the double break defence, and I think the rest of his players are good uh, and proven assets. Very one, nice. One question I'd ask really quickly on on this team is uh, for you, Abdul. What, what do you think of the defensive value? He has four or uh, two uh, four fives. Two four point five million defenders in Fofana and Eileen. Eileen, I understand because he gets the attacking returns. Um, do you think the value is there? Um, I think Fofana. What well, you think? Are you talking about Fofana? The value. Yeah. Of um, yeah. I mean, I think he's okay. I think he's a, he's he's a good value option for his price. Um, I think. I mean, the other options there because he's already got Eileen and, and Dunk. He could probably. He's he's got um, Lotin that I could go for, um, and he's got I can't remember any other other four point fives, but um, yeah, I mean I, I don't mind Fofana. Um, maybe there is a, there could be a you know a better pairing for the, for rotation with with, with Leeds you know, for Ailing. Um, I've not really looked at the Leicester and um, the Leeds rotation, but it could be good. So that's probably why he's got them. But yeah, I, I don't mind Fofana. I don't, I don't think he's a bad option. Mm-hmm. Nice. Um, you, you've been given bad score by Andy Martin for not having Rafinha, Benny. So he's going to take that up with you on Twitter. Um, and on that note, let's move on to FPL underscore tactician himself. So Andy Martin, he has a 3 5 2 here. He's got Mares and Son. He has double Liverpool defence. So he's got Backman and Foster as his goalkeepers, Trent, Robertson, and Kufal, Salah, Son, Mares, Rafinha, Buendia, Tony, Watkins, and then on the bench, Eiling. Omar Bambadeli and Oba Femi. Yeah. What, what are you thinking here, Abba? What are your thoughts on this formation, Morris mm-hmm. and Son, and then the double Liverpool defence? Yeah, I mean, it's a good team. I really like the defence. Um, I think it's interesting he's gone for Bachman over, um, over Sanchez, but I don't think Bachman is a bad option. Um, the only, t- I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm really not sure Mares. I think he's just um, a transfer waiting to happen. I know a lot of people are saying, you know, he should start the first three games, um, you know, because of the other kind of city midfielders not really back in training yet. Um, but I still think he, even when he starts, you know, he's kind of prone to, he, he could easily get, you know, kind of hold off early and uh, could, I mean, just predicting Pep is just not a good idea. Uh, and Son, um, I'm not really sure because he, he's got Maris and Son there, he's got no Bruno. So I think it's quite a risky team to start with. But the rest of it, I think it's perfectly fine. Uh, he's got, you know, a fairly. I mean, I think his bench is actually quite weak. Actually, just looking at his bench, he's only really got Ailing there, who's who is a playing, um, you know, a, a playing defender, and then Owen Bemidal and Wafami probably won't get any minutes. So, yeah, I think I think there's a wee bit too many too many risks in there. I do like the structure. I think you can maybe you know take out Mares and Son and maybe you know bring in Bruno and. I don't know who else you could probably get. I think you'd probably get in, um, another kind of 6.5 um, midfielder in there. Deli Ali? <laughs> not not <laughs> Deli Ali. Not Deli Ali. 
you know? <laughs> I, had to, I had to get that in there somehow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 yeah, I just, um, I think this team's a bit too risky for me. But um, okay. So um, did I, I might have missed it, but did you did you give a score out of 10? Was it like no, a four or something? Like, I'm going to have to go with a six. So, six, yeah, okay, six. Yeah. I was trying to get a four out of you. I've not seen any of the guests on the show give below a six yet, but yeah. hopefully you can be the first. Yeah. I hope I've pulled out a real horror submission somewhere. Yeah. Um, You're like manipulating the witness there. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, under duress, as they call it. So on to the next of um, our list of wonderful haulers team submissions. We have at FP underscore banger. They're a great podcast. Yeah. Um, I listen to these guys and I love their take on things it's quite nice to have a kind of slightly eastern kind of uh, perspective so i think i listened to some american fpl pods some european ones but they're the only guys i really listened to in the east so it's nice to get kind of all the mix of cultures playing fpl this is how we all kind of met and i don't think without fpl we would have all met each other so back to the real talk instead of life philosophy of how great the community is and um, we have sanchez and foster and goal we have trent robertson shaw and dean we have um, Salah and Fernandez, which I know you would want to see. But then we actually have Havertz and Smith Rowe, which is a bit different to what else has been coming before. And then the kind of the staples of Watkins and Tony mm. and the bench that everyone else has of Ailing and Brownhill. Um, there is a M- M- Mabud from Watford. Uh, again, I doubt he plays. Never heard of him. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, he's, yeah, I think he's probably going to get loaned out. But yeah, I really like this team. Um, it's got the exact same back line as me. Uh, the starters. The only players I'm not sure of is uh, Smithrow and Havertz. I mean, I've, I've mentioned Havertz. I don't know why I'm kind of not keen on him, just because of I'm not sure about his minutes. Um, I think Smithrow is probably in the same category. Although, admittedly, I've not really kind of looked into Smithrow because I've not really kind of ever considered, you know, the 5.5 midfielders or you know anyone around that price point. So, um, I still think it's a fairly strong team, though, um, and I think he's. Um, yeah, it's only the empty that I like. So he's got Tony as well, and he's got he's got a fairly strong bench with you know Ailing and Brownhill. Um, so you know I don't think he'll he'll necessarily need his third mid, third bench player that often. So I'll give this a, a seven point five. Okay, I like that. That's the first point five I think we've mm. had so far on yeah. that hole. So that's good. We're starting to get an extra twenty scores instead of ten going forward. So. Yeah. Let's go to, um, so the next one is at Vardy Boys. Um, so we have one million in the bank here because he wants to actually turn Havertz into Bruno. He wants um, one of his 7.5 million forwards as well to be sold in that transaction. So I- I'll talk about what he's going to do next, but let me talk about the team first. So Sanchez and Foster, Trent, Shaw, Kufal and White, Salah, Fernandez, Havertz, Rafinha, Watkins, Antonio, bench of Ailing Brownhill or Buffemi. So he's saying he's one million in the bank. The plan is to do Havertz plus Bruno plus one of the 7.5 mil forwards to Kane, one of Son or Sancho and a 6.5 mil mid. So I imagine this is a draft from Vardy Boys where he's expecting the Kane transfer to kind of yeah. drag on and maybe happen before the deadline um, ends at the end of August. So what do you think here? Is it worth having the one million in the bank? Would you be focusing on Kane without definitive news before a game week one deadline? Like, would you build that into your game week one team? Yeah, I think, you know, I actually, I actually really like this team. Um, I like the White as an option as well. Um, I, I like the midfield. Again, it's only Havertz who I'm not sure of, but um, I, I just think there's too many uncertainties with his, with his transfer plans. Um, I mean, there's just so much that we don't know yet, of, you know, whether Kane's even going to go to City, or you know what game week is going to start in, so I mean, I mean, I mean, I think I think the rumours at the moment is he starts in game week two, right? So that means he's going to this guy, uh, Vardy Boys, is going to have to take a hit in um, in game week two to bring in Kane. So if that's when he wants to bring him in, because you know home game to Norwich, is, you know, is a, is a perfect time to bring him in. So I think if he's going to plan to bring in Kane. I think it's best to go with a placeholder like you know, maybe something like Obama Young or something like that, you know, you know, for the first good fixture, and then bring in Kane Gaming too. I don't think it's wise to, to like plan hits already. But the actual team, um, I'll probably give a uh, seven. Okay, not bad. I know yeah. Gabe, you had a question, didn't you, before we move to the next draft? 
Well, yeah, now that, and, and actually uh, Harry at, at FPL Tips asked this in, in the chat as well. Now that we're seeing uh, Ben White in there and his, and his nice new Arsenal kit uh, for Unity, uh -huh. um, what, what do you think of Ben White versus Fofana as a 4-5 as a option? Who do you prefer and, and why? Um, I don't know. I, I'd, say they're, I'd say they're quite equal. So I think they're, they're, they're both are good 4.5 million options with a decent defence. Um, I think Arsenal probably got the you know probably the the better defence um, you know marginally, but both of them don't have any real attacking threat either. So um, yeah, I, I guess with with White and Fofana, I think it depends on, I mean, who you're rotating with. So um, I know Brighton and Arsenal have got a really really good kind of um, really good you know rotation pair you know up until like you know they've actually got a really good rotation up until gaming time yet. You know, it just works out that way. Is they've got a really good rotation, so you can do white and you know something like white and and Beltman. But um, again, I think it's with Fana, it would just depend on who you who you rotate them with. But as individual options, I think they're, they're pretty much similar. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice. Um, so another one of the lads that I happened to meet at this uh, FPL meetup. I promise there's no favourites here in the picks I've made. Um, at Trophy FPL, so he's got a three five two. He actually has a uh, Jota, Mares, and Loton as options that we don't see in many drafts. Um, his full team for the listeners is Sanchez and Foster in goal, Trent, Fofana, and White. He has Salah, Fernandez, Mares, Jota, and Rafinha with a Jota captaincy in game week one, um, the first non Salah captain we've seen all night. Antonio and Tony up front with Ailing, Loton, and Davis um, in the bench. Uh, what are your thoughts here on this team and what, what would you score it, Abdul? Yeah, I think um, I think he's a wee bit light in defence. Um, I also think he's got too many risks in midfield with Mares and Jota. Um, you know, he's got Salah there, he's got Bruno there, Rapina, which is good. But yeah, just again, too many risks. I think um, they kind of give this one a kind of give it a six as well. Yeah, oh, you want to go lower, Abdul? Come on, you know you want to go lower. I can see it in your face. Come on, yeah. <laughs> too many risks in midfield, weak defense, they, they, and only two they, strikes. They, they, that doesn't they, sound like a fix. The value was in defense, and they took money from defense and invested it in punts in midfield. Yeah, with no third striker. You, you know this. You want to get us below. Yeah. Well, let's start on a five. Let's, I'm sorry, Trophy. What I will say is, by the way, Trophy actually came. Um, I think he had a 1.8k and a 1.4k since his last two ORs. So we do him a disservice mocking him on there, but I'm sure he'll defend his honor one day. Hey, everyone's fair game if you submit a team. You're fair game. Let's go with a five. Yeah, five. Nice. I like it. We've got a, we've got a baseline of what future fives will be scored against now. So. Moving on to at FPL Flannel. So he has Meslier in goal, which is the first one we've seen tonight. He has Gunnarsson on the bench. He has Trent, Robertson, Shaw and Kufal. He has Salah, Fernandez, Rafinha, Smith-Rowe, Antonio and Watkins. His bench is Byrne, Kucho and Gilmore. Um, he has 0.5 million in the bank. What are your thoughts here? And is Smith-Rowe reliable? Because he doesn't really have a bench. Uh, yeah, I think... Um, I mean, he's... He's gone. He's got a decent. He's got a good midfield apart from Smith Rowe. He's got a good defence. I think Meslier probably isn't worth five point five. Sorry, five when you know you've got um, when you can get you know one of the defenders for four point five, and then you've got Sanchez there as well. Um, yeah, I think his his bench is really really weak as well. Um, but I, th I think the actual starting eleven isn't too bad. Um, I think I'd probably give this a, a 6.5. Uh, what if it was just the 11 you were scoring out of interest? Like if you weren't considering the fact that he has no cover or no depth? If it, if it was just the starting 11, I think I'd probably give this um, I'd give it an 8. Um, yeah, I think it looks strong, doesn't it? Yeah, I, the only player I don't like from the starting 11 is, is Smith Rowe. Um, mm. And as I said, admittedly, I've, I've not really looked into him too much. You probably know better than me, Nima, um, you know, what his kind of prospects are, but yeah, I'd, I'd give it an eight. He does have 0.5 in the bank, so um, mm -hmm. you know he could turn Burn into Eiling or something like that, and that would give him some yeah. 
Absolutely. Or, or Smith Rowe to a star where he's more kind of, I guess, nailed on to play because I know everyone thinks Smith Rowe's kind of been given the number 10 shirt, it guarantees minutes, but we gave William Gallas a number 10 shirt. So I'll kind of leave that yeah. conversation there. And if you want to know what I think about Smith Rowe, I do love him as an asset. Um, go back and listen to any one of the other preseason pods where I'm sure I lack, uh, wax lyrical. But so on to the next one. So we have at Ray underscore QUR. So there's Ray Qureshi, another friend of the show. Um, he actually had a fantastic interview with Josh Bull, the previous winner of FPL on his YouTube channel recently. So definitely mm-hmm. go check that out if you haven't. Um, he has a Backman and Foster and Gold, a combination that I have, which I know we're not seeing in many drafts. Um, he has Trent, Dinia and Shaw, Salah, Fernandez, Rafinha and Buendia, Watkins, Antonio, Tony, and then White, Brownhill and Omo Bombardelli on the mm-hmm. bench. It's a free for free, one million in the bank. Um, what are your scores here for Ray? I really like this team. Um, I think he's got a good back line. Uh, again, he's won Bachman over Foster, which I don't mind at all. Um, yeah, I mean, I think he can he can possibly use that one million to turn Tony into, into Wilson. I know you probably don't like that email, but um, it's, a, it's a really good team. I really like that team, actually. I think that this is probably the... I, and he's got a decent bench there as well with White and Brownhill. Um, who, mm. you know, who, are, who are playing, who, are, who will get minutes. So I think this is definitely the best one I've seen so far. Um, I'm actually quite, I'm, I'm quite surprised he's got one million in the bank. Cause I, me, so, so I was going to say, I, do you know what I love here? So he, I had a look at his team and my team was very yeah. similar. And yeah. I, I kind of said to him like, oh, this team, um, you know, I could turn my 4.5 mil defender to Dean if I got rid of Calvert-Lewin, because I got rid of Tony for Antonio, if you remember me saying. So yeah. I could kind of go from Calvert-Lewin to Tony, and then yeah. suddenly you've got much better assets. And you're, so Saar could become Buendia. So he's only three players away from me, I think. It's kind of Dean yeah. for one of my 4.5s, Buendia exactly. for my Saar, and then Tony for my DCL. But the one yeah. man in the bank, that is a bit of a shock. Yeah, yeah, no, it does. I'm just, I'm just kind of um, a bit bewildered by that. But that... I just go to show how, how good a team that is. Um, mm. I guess it means you don't have to always spend every penny to get a strong yeah. team out, right? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. We can yeah. be very guilty of that. So um, just because I want to get into the live Q&A as well, I do want to make sure that we do get through more of these teams that we've got from the kind of pre-submitted ones. So I want to make sure the live Q&A is quite fun. So mm-hmm. let's just do the last RMTs. There's only a few left. So we have at mm-hmm. Sacred Silence, um, another friend of the show. So... They've named this the penalty forwards party. Um, I ask, is this too many risks? So they have Backman and Foster. They have Trent, Shaw, Dean, Salah, Fernandez, Son, Buendia, and Saar, Tony, and Timo Puki. They also have Dunk on the bench with Omar Bombardelli and Oba Femi. What, what are your thoughts here, Abdul? I've mm-hmm. not seen a team like this. It's one of the reasons I picked it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean... Without sounding too harsh, it's, uh, I think this is probably the um, find a new low. I think this is probably the poorest team I've seen so far. I think I think it needs a few changes. <laughs> so um, we've seen a five. This must be below. Are you saying? Yeah, it has to be because that front line is just not sustainable. You know what I mean? It's got Tony and Pookie. Penalty um, forwards party. Is this now a good time to bring in the news that we saw today, Abdul? That perhaps before they made this draft, they hadn't seen that obviously the Premier League and Mike Riley, I think it is the chief of the Premier League referees, he said they're going to cut down on soft penalties this season and the yeah, changes yeah. to VAR, they believe it's going to prevent kind of 20 of the goals that got disallowed before from offside. Mm-hmm. So those kind of toenail offsides are no longer a thing, but also penalties like the one that Sterling wants to get England into the final of the Euros. Mm-hmm. Um, they're probably not going to be given either. So do you kind of think actually that now penalties are going down? Maybe you're being even harsher on this draft than you would have been prior to that news. And while we're here, as well as your score out of 10, what's your thoughts on that whole information that's come out that obviously um, it's the, people are saying death of penalties 03, 08, 21, and they're time stamping it. Like, is that true? I don't, I don't know. I mean, the thing with that information, honestly, I'd probably just ignore it because we don't know. I mean, the, the rules are always there, but they're not always implemented the way they should. So, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, the, the penalty ratio stayed the same or, or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I, w- I wouldn't read too much into that information, you know, in terms of applying it to our FPL teams. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, me personally, I think I'm just going to kind of not take that into consideration at all when looking at my FPL team or, you know, thinking about penalty takers. Um, going back to the team, again, too many, I mean, that, that front line and, and bench just kind of... Um, 
it needs to be reinvested, I think. Um, I just think Son, I don't know if he's kind of worth the early fixtures, and then, and then Pukki's early fixtures are, are terrible. Um, I, I know he kind of got off, got off to a flyer, you know, two seasons ago, you know, scoring against like City and Liverpool and that, but don't think By the way, I good. should say they, they have already got Watkins instead of Pukki now, in case that changes your score out of 10. Oh, the yeah. team has evolved since they submitted once, that's why once you. you submit the test i'm sorry <laughs> there is no changes yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna rate the team that's here right yeah um, yeah yeah let's do that we need something below the five we need a new baseline below that i think i'm gonna go to 4.5 that's being okay generous. It's not a four that's just being <laughs> that's being generous and one thing i realized by the way um abdul is we didn't actually um as much as we wax lyrical about ray's team we didn't give it a score out of 10 and also tom stevenson he's kind of asked where would you go from the 6.5 so i know we've both said this is great but you can't really transfer any of your defenders and strikers like you would probably yeah. keep it for at least five weeks and you're going to keep Salah yeah. and fernandez so what do you do for Fina and Bantia Tomer? Like, where do we go from Tom Stevenson? And also, what do you score? No, Ray? I think uh, Tom Stevenson's comment was for the next one. The, for the, the next two, one, the, okay. the two six point five forwards. So the what, forwards, what's, okay. Uh, what's the grade here? Well, I was also thinking this about this team because I feel like Rafinha and Bantia are the only ones I would sell. But yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, what's your score out of ten for Ray? And we'll go look at the next team for the six point five. For this one, um, I think I'd give it a nine. Nine. Wow. Okay. Ray, you got your answer. Yeah. yeah. Um. What yeah. about here? I don't see two six point five. I thought Pookie was six mil. Six mil. Yeah. Six, six mil. Six. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Fine. So, yeah. That, that's why I thought the six point five was about the last team. But um. Mm. Okay. So we have at FPL Moose. He's got a four four two. They want to know if it's worth all the sacrifices made elsewhere, where because they've kind of gone for big guns in the midfield. Um. They have Sanchez and Foster, Robertson, Ailing, Fofana, and. Sierra Alta starting in the 11. I think this might just be them trying to troll me for the recording. But um, Salah, Fernandez, De Bruyne, and Smith Rowe, Bamford, and Watkins. So, first Bamford we've seen, first De Bruyne we've seen, Brownhill, Aitnori, first Aitnori we've seen, and Davis. Um, what are your thoughts on Moose's team and what score would you give it? Yeah. Uh, you know what? It's, 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 it's different. Um, I'm not sure about Sierra Alta if, he, if he's even a starter. Um, I've not been really looking at what for defense apart from um, you know, Kiko. Um, but uh, well, I just actually noticed he's not got Trent as well, so he just got Robo. Yeah, I, th I think this team is is really risky because I mean he's got KDB, which I think is fine because he's got um, uh, he you know he started training, so he should you know he should start the the season. But um, yeah, again, I just think Bamford probably better value options than him. You know, in the seven point five range, um, I, I think the Salah, Bruno, and KDB is really hampering. His his defense, and I think I would probably take out KDB and kind of reinvest that that money. Um, and the bench, I think as well. Eight Nuri, I'm not sure if he's nailed. I know he's been starting a lot preseason, and then Davis is obviously not not starting either. So I'll probably I think I'm gonna have to give this um, a six point five as well. I just think yeah. there's too many lists in there, and I think the, the the heavy midfield just really hampers the rest of the squad. Okay. Let's um for, for these next ones, Abdul, we're gonna go like sub 30 seconds. Um just because I realized that we're already one hour forty seven now and yeah. we want to get to the QA because that will probably take at least 15, 20 minutes. So yeah. let's just give these ones a score, maybe. And I don't think you need to talk about okay. the players unless there's a new player that we've not discussed on a previous mm -hmm. draft. Um so we have at FPL underscore pot noodle. Um they have Sanchez and Begovic, Shaw, Chilwell, Trent Dean. So Chilwell's, Chilwell's been included for the first time. He's also been mentioned in the chat tonight. We have Salah, Greenwood, De Bruyne, Rafinha, Watkins, Antonio, with a bench of Brownhill, Ailing, Obafemi. So they've said KDB only a fit. Otherwise, that would be turned into Havertz, Mane, or Bruno. So what's your score out of 10 here? And then we'll just kind of go through the rest in the same um, format. 7.5. 7.5. And just on Chilwell, any thoughts on him? Because it's his first inclusion. Yeah, I, I, I like Chilwell. Um, simply due to the fact that he's a great option, you know, great attacking stats. And one thing I noticed as well, every time he got benched last season, um, he never came on once. Um, so I think that kind of plays in his favor. But at the same time, um, I'm still unsure of his minutes. But when he starts, a great option. Are you okay with no Bruno? Um, he's got KDB there, so um, yeah, I, I guess 
I did I did write him down on 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 no Bruno side of KDB, but that's I mean I probably would have got an eight if it, if you had Okay, so go from six point five to an eight if that was a Bruno. I like that. No, no, no. I said uh, seven point oh, five. Oh, seven point five. Okay, seven point five to an eight. Yeah, if you had Bruno instead of KDB. I've seen a lot of low scores recently, so I've lost track. Um, <laughs> at yeah. Wild Rover FPL, so Martin. Um, so he has Henderson in goal with Foster. He has Trent Shaw, Dean. A couple of new inclusions in Ben Rama and Kane. So again, two that mm. make it for the first time tonight. Buendia, Salah, Smith Rowe, Antonio Watkins. Another new inclusion on the bench of Fraser, Johnson, and Duffy. Um, what are your thoughts here? He has one million in the bank and no Man United attack. Like, what would you score this out of 10? And what do you think of Ben Rama Kane? Um, yeah, I think I'd probably give this a six. Um, actually, I'd give it a 5.5. .5. I just think um, Ben Rama is nowhere near nailed. Um, the bench. Um, is really, I mean, I, I don't even know if, if Fraser is a, is a starter, so he could have like a, a you know, a totally kind of non playing bench as well, and then obviously Smith Rowe there as well. So, um, I like him as an option if he goes to, if he goes to City, but um, I just think his midfield is too weak and his bench is too weak. Okay, um, I'm just apologizing to some people in the chat. So, a very good friend of the show, Nehal, he's um, team isn't in the slides today, but. I will if you retweet it again tomorrow when we're done with the show. We'll have another look at it and I will ask Abdul for a score. Don't worry. Um, I'd like to help anyone who's a hauler and has been with us from the start, kind of watching live every week since March. So I'm sorry you didn't make it, but there is genuinely just way more popularity than I ever thought when I asked for these drafts. And Abdul, you're a very popular man. So thank you for these ratings. And people are already saying in the chat they're going to rethink this the safety of their starting 11 the ownership and they're going to make a new draft based off of your 4.5 out of 10 review you gave them earlier they, they are they are here listening so they are going to yeah. take it on board so that's great news um we have at fpl underscore bruce um here are sanchez and foster trent robertson shaw kufal salah fernandez rafinha buendia watkins antonio bench of eiling basuma davis um 0.5 million in the bank 442 what is your score out of 10 very quickly um, I'm going to give this a, an 8.5. I really like it. I, like, I think it's the best 4 4 2 I've seen so far. Um, very nice. Yeah. That's that's very good. But I did think when I saw that 11, there's nothing I could argue about. And yeah. then Aiding and Basuma are both guaranteed yeah, the best, to play. Yeah. So it's fantastic. Um, one thing I forgot is. Did, did you mention just a little bit about Kane? So I know earlier when we spoke in the show, you actually said like you wouldn't start game week one with him in mind, considering that the rumours are he probably won't start till minimum game week two. And with the mm. transfer target looming over him, like would you start a season with him knowing that he's already been told to us to not play game week one? Like surely if you want him, you would kind of factor him into your future thinking, not start with him as um, the previous draft did. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I've, I've not really thought much about it. I'm not, I'm not going to until he actually moves. But yeah, if he wasn't going to start game week one, there's no way I would, I would start yeah. with him. Against City and he's not starting, Like, why have yeah. him, right? Exactly. I mean, I think... Okay. That, yeah. So yeah, no, no, we'll just keep going because I, I want to make sure we get to the good live Q&A. So yeah, 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 uh, yeah. at JMC7070, Johnny Belfast, he's got a free for free he wants to know what to do with his double villain game before. I think we've answered that before. So if he goes back a few drafts, he'll be able to hear that. Um, do you trust Saar? That's a good first question because we had a brief chat about him, but not much. He has Sanchez Foster, Trent Shaw Diaz. So maybe we talk about Diaz and Saar in this one. He has mm. Fernandez Salah Buendia, Cavani Watkins Tony, Bench of Veltman Brownhill Good. What, what's your score out of 10? And what do you think of Saar? Can we trust him? And would um, you be starting with City Defenders? Yeah, I'm going to give this a seven. Um, just simply because of Cavani and uh, Diaz, I think there's much better options there. And I, I do like Sar as an option. I think he, for six million, he's he's good value. He's he's played. He's got Premier League experience, and the stats last season were, were awesome as well. Uh, so Great. for six million, he's a good option, and he could be on penalties as well. I am liking that. Yeah, I've seen him take some in preseason, and obviously there's the debate about if Dini starts, but. I don't know because they've got like seven, eight forwards in FPL, I think, most of any club. Um, we have a few yeah. final ones. So at Paula B16, she said, Do your worst. Um, she has Sanchez mm -hmm. and Foster, Shaw Trent, Kufal, Salah Fernandez, Havertz, and Harrison, not Rafinius. So maybe we talk about Harrison and Havertz here. Tony Watkins, Antonio, White, Gilmore, Manquilla. What's your score out of 10? And what do you think about Harrison and Havertz? 
Yeah, I, I don't mind Harrison. I think he's a great option for six million, good value. Um, yeah, I, I quite like that team actually. Um, decent bench as well with two two playing players. Again, it's only Havertz that I really don't like in that. I think you can probably you know downgrade Havertz and upgrade Tony maybe to another to a seven point five. But yeah, I'd, I'd give this a seven. Nice. Another one of the final three now. So at the gangster with an X, um, Shams, another regular of the show, has also started writing recently. Some great threads on Twitter. Um, he has no Bruno, doesn't plan on getting Kane till at least September, and he already has 1.5 million in the bank to do Havertz to Sun in game week two. So he's kind of, I guess, targeting the Crystal Palace fixture for Havertz and Sun. He wants to avoid that City match. Um, he has Foster and Meslier. Um, he has Trent Wambisaka and Fofana. He has Salah, Greenwood, Havertz, and Barnes. So I want to draw attention to kind of Barnes here specifically and Meslier. Um, Watkins, Antonio Cavani, Bench of Veltman, Brown Hill, and Hoover. Would you score um, Shamsis team out of 10? Um, I'm going to have to give this a, a 6.5. Six point five. Okay, yeah. and what, what do you feel about um, Barnes? Someone said that earlier in the chat. They said that he just started a game. He had sixty to seventy minutes. Looked good. Um, is that someone you would go for with the uncertainty? No, uh, just simply due to the uncertainty, um, especially not for game week one. Um, no. Not somebody that I could really trust. No. And then final two. So at FPL underscore four P, he has Backman and Foster Shaw. Target, Veltman, and Kufal. Um, so, yeah, quite light defence. Um, Salah, Fernandez, Son, and Havertz. Antonio mm-hmm. and Watkins with Gibbs, White, Obafemi, and Manquilla on the bench. So he's gone big in the middle with four almost premium price players in the middle of the park. And he wants to do Havertz to Mahrez in game week two and has no trend. W- what are your thoughts here? What would you score this out of 10? Uh, yeah, I'm going to... I mean, no Liverpool defence. This has to be like a, a 5.5 for me. Um, 5.5. Especially with, yeah, especially with like Havertz and just like no Liverpool defense and quite quite weak defense as well. And I think defense. I think mm-hmm. so. So the final one then. So Astrolar MMB one. So Simeon Astrolar regular of the show as well. He has zero million in the bank. Backman and Meslier. He has Dean Shaw for Fana Kufal. He has Salah Mane and Smith Rowe. So I thought this was quite interesting. He has Calvert Lewin, Antonio, and Jimenez. As well as Rafinha, Diaz, and Brownhill. Um, it's a very interesting 15 with the likes of kind of Jimenez, Mane, Diaz, and Smith Rowe. Um, there's also obviously the likes of Rafinha and Diaz bench for their tougher fixtures. Um, I feel like this is going to be a very interesting one to talk about as our final one, which is why I left it till the end. What do you think here? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think Jimenez is a really risky option because we don't know what he's going to be like after his. Um, his injury Diaz is just way too expensive to, to bench. Um, and then Mane Salah double up. I mean, I'm not totally against the Mane Salah double up to be honest. Um, but no Liverpool defense. I think it's one of those teams where it kind of looks good and it could work out, but it's just riddled with risks. And um, yeah, and then you've got there's too much money, there's too much money in, in the goalkeepers as well. Um, you got the but you got the Mane as well, right? You got the kind of the Mane um, and Salah double up over Bruno, as you say. You've got the five mil yeah. and a four point five keeper. You got six mil defender bench. Um, someone asked, "Is this a zombie team?" So I think uh, my question for you is, what would you score it generally, and then what would you score it if it was a zombie team? I think generally, generally, I'd, I'd give it a five because although it has good players, I just don't think the structure is right at all. Um, so I'd give it a five, but as a zombie team, um, I'd probably you know give it a. a Wait, I'll, I'll, I'll put it back on the screen for you. I just realised you were yeah. trying to review it, and I removed it from the screen. Yeah, so no, you're no, your no. final score <laughs> seven point five as a zombie team. Okay, yeah. so this will be the first time we've got to like one hour fifty eight, and we're just getting to the live Q and A. So this is definitely um, later than I promised Abdul he'd be gone. So yeah, I'm going to start yeah. pulling up questions that came in the live chat, Abdul. Um, we had talked about kind of a few things while i'm pulling up some questions i'd love to hear from you about what you consider kind of maybe your best moment of last season what your worst moment of last season was and what was the lesson you learned and in the meantime i'm going to start going through the viewer q a's and gabe as well if you see any like 
uh, put them through in the chat. We'll start to pull them up. Mm -hmm. So you want me to... So, so best moment, worst moment, and then lesson uh, learned, all from last season, I guess. Um, I think the best moment was probably um, playing my bench boost in game week 19. That took me from like 18k to 5k. I think that was a real turning point in my season. And um, from there on, I just kind of, um, you know, kind of stayed within that kind of range. I didn't really, to be honest, I actually was quite lucky. I didn't really have any bad moments last season. I think the most frustrating thing about last season, though, was the fact that once I got to 5K, once I made that move in game week 19, I didn't really kind of make any real strides. Um, so I, I got to 5K in game week 19 and I finished 4.9K. Um, so I was just kind of yo yoing up and down between, you know, 5 and 12K. So I guess that was quite frustrating. Um, but yeah, I, I guess overall you know the season was was fantastic nice um so just before we go into the q a um we've got the first few questions ready to pull up on screen i'm gonna play another short um ad so we're in a partnership with all about fpl.com where i am one of the co-editors with surya and his team it's a completely free to use site it intends to always stay that way so while we all just kind of have a drink for 20 seconds i'm just going to play you um mariners what are you waiting for <laughs> Are you craving more FPL content? Then look no further than allaboutfpl.com. Head over there for weekly articles from some of the top content creators on the planet. So what are you waiting for? Head over to allaboutfpl.com, the website for all your FPL needs. So what are you waiting for, Gabe? It's a great impression, I have to say. It's the best one I've heard yet. I can tell you've been practicing, Nima. I, well, it's a new one for me, but let's get up the first question from Andy Martin. So he asks, Abdul, do you know your game week one to game week four captains already, or are you flexible? Uh, yeah, I think um, I've already got them, them planned out. I think the, the first in the first four game weeks, I'm captain Salah three times. Um, to be honest, I, I'd written it down um, a few weeks, like last week, and I, 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 don't, I, I wrote them down for like the first eight game weeks. But um, I've kind of forgotten now. But I know that Salah was in there like about five, five or six times. So yeah, I do captain. Um, um, I do plan the captains, and I will captain them. I will plan for the first eight game weeks, definitely. Do you remember last season when there was a very brief period uh, at the way didn't have Salah, and I DM'd you to say you should rename to FPL Mane. <laughs> you betrayed him. You yeah, betrayed yeah. him. <laughs> so when, when it comes to FPL, there's no biases. Um, even though I love the guy. No, if he if he turns into a you know, terrible player, he's he's going right on my team. <laughs> and do what I did, man. I sold him in his blank game week in 29 for Aubameyang, who then had malaria and oh. blanked. And over the next two game weeks, he still kind of underscored Salah's game week 30 just from one game week. Um, but no, um, we have another question here as well. So we have a uh, wrong one. I clicked the wrong one. So we have Raman Afin here. So he says, Tips for players or managers who are just a year into the game or less. So I know some people joined midway through last season. This will be their first full mm -hmm. season. What's your advice to those managers? Um, I would say, for, for me, I think the best way to learn, honestly, is to, to learn from other you know top managers who have been playing the game a long time. I think for me, that's been you know one of my you know how I've improved my game so much is kind of discussing and talking to other kind of like-minded managers and guys who've been playing the game a long time. That's where I've learned the most from. I mean, uh, obviously reading articles and stuff is great, but I think to actually improve your game, um, you know, like from the core, um, it's definitely good to um, at least, you know, kind of follow, uh, you know, if you've got Twitter, I think Twitter's a great place for the FPL. You know, it can be obviously a bit overwhelming at times, but I think it's a great place to kind of, you know, follow all these top managers and see what they're doing and learn from them. I think that's a really good tip. Um, something I'm just going to pull up your uh, your first draft app. Though. I'm just going to quickly pull it up on screen because there is a question about it. Um, so they ask, in your first draft, you have two 6.5 mids, Buendia and Rafinha. How do you move to a 7.5 to 9 million midfielder um, if they start firing kind of from week one? And I think they said the same is true of team two. Like what do you do here where you've got all the money in the back? So in either draft, like, what do you do if that 7.5 to 9 mil range kind of pops off? What, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I, I guess I'd just have to find which player to sacrifice. I guess with a 4-3-3, I think the fall guy would probably be Robertson uh, because I've already got Trent, 
uh, on the double up. So for that, it would be Robertson uh, I'd get rid of. Um, in the three four three, I'm not entirely sure to be honest. Um, I, I guess I just have to kind of. I mean, I, I think I find it really hard trying to answer these types of questions, which are quite like you know scenario based, but. I think before it happens as well, like you happens, might have yeah. backed the right horse, right? Exactly, yeah. So I think with these things, it's just kind of like you know, just cross that bridge when you come to it. Um, I mean, there's always options available, and there's always kind of different ways to kind of play the game. So, but yeah, um, I just have to find find a sacrifice somewhere, or just kind of you know, trust my insects and go with my original picks. Fair enough. Um, we have a question here from John Chappelle. So he came 14th last year. Um, I see a few jokes wow. recently on Twitter, John, where someone said, or in a reply to a tweet, sorry, what rank did you come? And he said 14th. He said, I like to rustle feathers. I know it pisses people off. So I just want to shout you out for that one. Um, his question to you is, earlier on you said that you don't really worry about your OR in the first few weeks because you know that lots of people are using chips and there's variants and eventually the cream will rise to the top. Um, what game week would you start panicking if you're not a good overall rank? Um, I know for me, just to say firstly, like I'm aiming for top 100k as I mentioned. Um, if I'm not there by about, I'd say game week 30, that's when I'd be panicking. I don't really think I even consider worrying before that for a top 100k. But what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, shout out to John Chappell. Like 14th is amazing, um, fantastic kind of overall rank, but. Uh, which game would I start panic? I, I'd say probably around about, I think, I wouldn't say panic, but I would start kind of really thinking about it around about game week 25. Um, you know, when you've got, about, you know, you've gone into the three quarter way of the season, I start thinking, okay, you know, what can I do to change or what, you know, what can I do to kind of propel myself back up? So, yeah, I'd, I'd say probably game week 25. 25 okay that's interesting yeah. and we have one more question from uh, mark daniels norman conquest he says if lukaku and kane do respectively kind of move to chelsea and city who would you leave out from salah lukaku bruno and kane or would you actually be trying to juggle all four premiums unless they have terrible mm. fixtures it's quite the hypothetical <laughs> that isn't yeah we were talking about mm. hypotheticals but we were talking about lukaku and kane yeah. yeah i mean i think for me I'd definitely be more interested in Kane than Lukaku, so I think I'd probably take Lukaku out of the picture. Um, yeah, but I, I think I, I think to get Kane, I think the, the fall guy for me would be would be Bruno. And um, yeah, I, I'm not sure about the kind of juggling them in, in between the fixtures because you know because it's a forward a forward in the midfield that you're, you're looking at making two transfers. Um, so it'd have to be like you know really. Everything would have to go kind of according to plan, which you know probably wouldn't because you know you've got other, you'll have like other fires to put out, you'll have injuries. So yeah, I mean, I, I've, I mean to answer the question, Lukaku would probably not be in my thinking, and uh, I'd probably go with uh, Salah and, and Bruno or, or Salah and Kane to go with proven assets, and then maybe say game week seven when those Chelsea fixtures turn. If if Lukaku has brought himself into our thinking, we've had the time to decide at least, right? Yeah, possibly, possibly. But I, I can't see me, even with Chelsea's fixtures, you know, taking Kane out for Lukaku. Fine. Um, um, yeah. We have a question from 11 Plus Wizard. It was earlier on. He said, how rotation prone is Cavani? So I know we can't obviously answer that definitively, but my understanding was that obviously he's getting on a bit. Um, he is still a great player, don't get me wrong, but it looks like when they bought Varane at United, they were talking about that allows them to play some new kind of interesting tactics. Um They've talked about 4 3 3 in the past. Um, I think in that 4 3 3, I'm not convinced Cavani would be the starter. I think it would be a more fluid and pacey front three. So you're looking at the likes of Marshall, uh, Sancho, Greenwood, maybe Rashford. So kind of those four would be competing for those three spots. Um, I feel like Cavani would be a rotation risk then. However, with Rashford out now, like, is Cavani an interesting punt, I guess, to start the season? And because for me, once Rashford's back from his surgery, I. I wouldn't be going near Cavani personally, but maybe at least now while Rashford's out, would that kind of get into your thinking? There was a few drafts tonight, wasn't there, yeah. with him in it? I mean, I just think there is still the uncertainty there. And, and because he's 8.5, and, you know, just because the options we've got are 7.5, I mean, and even DCL at 8, I just don't see, you know, any reason to go with Cavani. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Like, I, I wouldn't go near there. I think most of us have probably Shaw or some kind of United 
defensive asset, yeah. whether it's Henderson or someone else. Um, we all have Bruno most likely, and if we don't, we've got at least Greenwood. And if Sancho is kind of one of your options you're thinking about, I'd rather be kind of looking there for my United assets and putting one yeah. on Cavani. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going to go to the last kind of one or two questions before we wrap up and get out of here for the night. So there's a few people who are just thanking you, Abdul. They're already pleased that you rated their teams. They're really happy yeah. i think a lot of them are taking that advice on board so good, good. it's been very helpful um so the last couple of questions we have one of them is from shams so it's to everyone he kind of says what do you think about regulion and fafana um especially when regulion is now under nuno who is supposedly playing a kind of attacking back four um not the free back three that we were expecting from him potentially where people got excited about Doherty now but Doherty's on the transfer list so um, <laughs> with that Doherty news out the window Regulian, I think he's only five mil so what do you think of kind of him and a 4.5 for Fana together as a pair um, to be honest I've not really looked at their I mean is that does, does he mean is a rotation it, it sounds it? like it I'm not sure their fixtures rotate well um but maybe they do. He can hopefully he'll mention in the chat at some point. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I've not really looked at right, right I'm not really interested in the spot of defense. Um, and as I said, Fana, I think it is a good option. It's not really something that excites me just because he's like, he's he's not really got much attacking threat. And I think there's other better 4.5 million uh, defenders, just like Ailing there, for example. Um, so, yeah, I mean, First thoughts on, on Reglan for Fana is that, no, I, I don't really like it. But, I mean, if they rotate well, maybe. But I think, yeah, I, I, I'm not really... Generally, you know. Spurs defence, no-go. I think I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah so the final question from another regular of the show is Davindra Raj, and then we will really get out of here. So it says he has Salah and Son. He says... Mm -hmm. um, the part of the question that confused me is he said, would you consider Mane for Bruno? So I just wanted to put that up there. Uh, Davindra, uh, maybe you can tell us, like you have a lot of drafts in your camera roll, I can tell, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how Mane is coming in for Bruno with Salah and Son, but maybe you can yeah. clarify. In the meantime, um, my, my question is, would you double up on Salah and Mane? Because the popular move seems to be Robbo and Trent plus Salah. Would you yeah. ever do it the other way around at the cost of Bruno especially? Uh, no, I wouldn't do it at the cost of Bruno, but I mean, I just think, I mean, I've, I've got a, I've got a good feeling about Manny this season, right? But I don't usually make decisions on, on good feelings. So, but yeah, um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't sacrifice him for I wouldn't sacrifice Bruno for Manny, especially when you've got Salah there. But um, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Manny had a, a banging season, you know, this year. I think last season was a bit of a, an anomaly for him. But um, yeah, to play it safe. Um, you know, if you look at ownership and, you know, even Bruno's credentials, much safer to go with Bruno. We have put his correct team up for the podcast listeners. So he has Salah, Son and Bruno, and it would have been Mane for Bruno. But um, it's yeah. nice to hear your thoughts on that. So I think we're pretty much wrapped up for the evening now. Um, it's been a pleasure, Abdul. Um, we have kept you far Thank too long. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the music to get us out of here. Thank you to everyone who tuned in. Um, it's been great chatting to you all on the show. And... We're hoping that maybe Abdul can come back in the future because Hibbo is very upset that he missed this show, Abdul, and he would love to speak to you and pick your brain in a future yeah. time. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely come on again. Awesome, yeah. and um, yeah. looking forward to kind of um, reading through the rest of your preseason content on Fantasy Football Hub. And you know, awesome. if anyone wants to find the link to Abdul's articles, we will share it tomorrow. So the whole mini series that he wrote, twenty-one thousand words. Um, it, it's kind of double the length of my dissertation, I believe. So <laughs> you will do well reading it. You will honestly do well reading it. But on yeah. that note, it's been a pleasure, Abdul. Pleasure, Gabriel. Thank Thanks to everyone in the live chat. And we'll see you guys. I'm just going to put this on.